Okay, good evening everybody. There we are. Okay, getting everything all set here finally. Good evening, welcome back to Exploring Lord of the Rings. This is session 91 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings, the session in which we are actually, I think that hoof shall touch water in the ford this very evening, right? We've been, we've been approaching the ford. It's like, the, you know, our classroom version of the flight to the ford has been kind of like that old math joke, right? About like getting halfway there and then getting halfway there and then getting halfway there and never actually arriving, right? We've been kind of like that tonight, right? The horses shall enter the ford. I know, Mudmore, I know a bunch of people have been pining for the ford. Um, very true. But anyway, tonight, it's actually, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm so sure. Um, yeah, I know, Trifle, it's, uh, that would be a funny metaphor, except, yeah, exactly. It's just, it's all too, it's all too accurate. Um, anyhow, welcome. So it is the 29th of January, 2019, for those of you who are listening asynchronously. Um, and uh, we are... Um, we are pretty excited, uh, pretty excited to be back. A couple quick announcements first before um, uh, before we begin, and that is uh, uh, number one. There's uh, uh, one thing that's go going on later this week. So the Mythgard Movie Club is back. The Mythgard Movie Club is going to be talking about Blade Runner this week on Thursday. Uh, so if you go to signumuniversity.org, scroll down a bit, you'll see the Blade Runner event uh, page. Uh, so Blade Runner this week. So they're talking about the, the original Blade Runner film this week, and then a couple months down the the road they're going to talk about the new Blade Runner film uh, so uh, that's gonna I, I think it's it's a, it's a really cool pairing so uh, I know I'm looking forward to that so Blade Runner discussion this Thursday evening uh, so that's one thing uh, that's happening uh, two moots that are coming up soon and registration is open and almost open so Sunshine Moot is the next moot that is happening that's uh, coming up in or near well near Orlando Florida um, in um, March. So that's on March 23rd. Uh, and that's the one, the, reg we, the registration should be open for that like within 24 hours. So keep looking, uh, keep coming back and we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll definitely be able to hook you up with registration for that very, very soon. Um, Nader Moot registration is open, however. Uh, that's our Moot, uh, that is so Sunshine Moot in Orlando, March 23rd. In April 13th, just a couple weeks down the road from that, uh, we're going to be in the Netherlands, uh, over at Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, our second moot, our second European moot, we were in the UK last year in London. We're going to be in Leiden in the Netherlands this year on April 13th. So you can uh, you can actually register for Nader Moot uh, now. The registration's open for that. Um, so that's, um, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, hey, Brian, congratulations. Welcome. for uh, Brian Kelly just caught up with us today. I always feel like we need to like throw a party for the people who, uh, you know, catch up through all of the back episodes and then join us live. Right. It's kind of a big deal. Um, but uh, yeah, Brian, I can imagine if you're used to listening to me at 2x speed, I must sound very strange. Uh, it's funny. I, I actually um was having that conversation with a couple of people at text mood where they were like, wow, your voice sounds weird <laughs> because they usually listen to me speed it up, which I totally get. Um, uh, but <laughs> oh, that was you at text mood, Brian. <laughs> okay. That's cool. That's cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. So anyway, welcome. Uh, welcome to, uh, welcome to live class here. That's great. Um, anyway. Okay. So sunshine moot, 23rd of March, Nader Moot on the 13th of April, and of course, Myth Moot, the big one happening at the end of June, 27th uh, through the 30th. Oh, cool. We have a mountain wall. A, a first person joining us live there on Twitter there tonight, too. Excellent. Glad, glad you could join us. Um, anyway, yeah, so... Uh, so we're going uh, to, lots of moots coming up. Myth moot is really the major event of the year. Um, uh, Myth moot is the, th like the regional moots are really, really wonderful and such a, and it's been such a great opportunity to go around and meet folks. But, uh, but yeah, I, um, uh, you know, they're, they're like the, like a taste of, uh, of, of the feast that shall be set before you at Myth moot, uh, which is really great. I was just talking with, 
<laughs> actually, Druid, this is Druid's Fire's suggestion, actually. I was just tweeting last night. I was reading Prince Caspian uh, with my son, Matthias, and um, we got to that uh, passage, which is a really wonderful Winnie the Pooh joke. And um, at least that's how I've always read it. Uh, and yeah, the part where they take the apples and they wrap them up in bear meat and then roast them on the fire. And so I was just I was just tweeting last night like it's it's on my bucket list. I really want to have an apple wrapped in bear meat uh, and uh, uh, and roasted over an open fire. And Druid's fire was like myth mood. And I'm like, oh, man, that can totally happen. There are even outdoor fire pits there. We can complete. We have, we have to find some bear meat and we can totally make this happen. Um, anyway. Yeah. So this is um, uh, this is this I uh, really this this should happen right if we can if we can get some bear meat at myth Moot this year we're absolutely this is this is absolutely gonna occur uh uh but anyway yeah you know we're, we're that's that's fine uh so myth Moot, 27th through the 30th of june um and um let's see so that was those are the announcements thursday blade runner myth garden movie club and then sunshine moot and nader moot and myth moot coming up all right. Uh, so let us jump in tonight and actually uh, with um, uh, in, in, in celebration of Brian's joining us, uh, we will let's go back. Let's go backwards because I like to do this occasionally. I want to I want to, you know, help to support those people who are still working their way through, even though, of course, since they're working their way through, they won't hear this until like, you know, months from now. I know that. But anyway, still, I like to go back and answer. So we're going to do a little bit of a throwback. Shouldn't take us too long. Uh, and that is uh, to the Barrow Downs. This was from Archimago, another awesome person I got to meet at Texmoot. Okay. In episode 44, ages ago, it suggested that Tom's main goal is to discourage the hobbits from trying to retrieve their clothes from the barrow, right? You know, when Sam asks what, you know, what's come of the clothes and everything. Uh, very sensible, but that explanation doesn't feel quite feel right to me. Rather, I get the impression that Tom is trying to distract them from wondering too much about what happened to their clothes, right? Um, he's, remember Tom says, uh, you know, you won't see your clothes again. Uh, and then Pippin asks, why not? And Tom totally dodges that question. He never answers the question, why not? Um, wh why won't they ever see their clothes again? So Archimago has a couple suggestions for why that might be. First, the hobbits clearly view the idea of losing their clothes somewhat lightly. Pippin is half amused, and even Sam looks as if he expects to find a neatly folded pile of clothes close by. They are about as far as one could possibly be from imagining the horrors of being dragged unconscious into a tomb and stripped naked by cold, dead hands. I think this alone would be sufficient reason for Tom to dissuade them from thinking too much about their clothes. They're already recovering from the horror of their experience, Hobbit resilience, and Tom doesn't want to remind them of it. That seems to me very, very plausible. Um, and I really like that line of thinking, right? If they if they think too much, it's not that like the clothes are so especially horrible that Tom doesn't want them thinking about that. But again, if they think about it too much, it would lead them to like reliving things or even going back in their imaginations and feeling th that they don't even remember because they were unconscious at the time, right? But it is, it does, if you start, f f you know, going down that little imaginative rabbit hole, right? You can see how it's going to inescapably lead them to some very detailed, very horrifying concepts, picturing the feel of like the cold, dead fingers of the whites on their bodies as they're taking their clothes off. It's, I mean, you just kind of, I, I, I agree. Uh, that would seems like a good idea for Tom to say, let's just, yeah, don't, don't go there. Right. Um, he says, I also think it's quite possible that their clothes are not, in fact, in, in, uh, in neatly folded piles, rather that they have been cut off with a knife and are now lying in tatters. Carefully undoing buttons on a waistcoat seems a bit dainty for a Barrow White. Certainly this realization, if true, would have been even more horrifying. So yes, again, like to, to fill their imagination with, uh, more and more horrifying things, though, uh, Mike made a comment that he was like really struck by the image of the dainty Barrow White, right? Um, at the, in the end, I'm not sure, right? I'm not sure what's more horrifying in the end, right? Um, if um, 
if it's more horrifying to imagine uh, your, their clothes being cut off with a knife, or if it's, uh, I actually kind of find it much more creepy, right? To uh, uh, imagine like the dead fingers neatly like unbuttoning your waistcoat and like peeling back your clothes, like that actually seems to me much more creepy uh, than uh, than imagining them being cut away with a knife. But really, either way, um, yeah. Um, yeah, Trifle was just thinking the same thing. I, I definitely, um, yeah, yeah, thinking, I mean, exactly. I mean, there's really, like, there's no way that that imaginatively leads to anything positive, right? I mean, it can only, it's only a question of, like, what degree and at what register of creepy is that going to be, right? I mean, let's, let's just, yeah. Um, so, anyhow, uh, agree with that. Finally, I have one more idea that seems like a bit of a leap, but which nevertheless seems plausible to me. The hobbits are dressed in the cerements of the tomb's original inhabitants, as part of the Barrowite's dreadful ritual. I wonder if the hobbits' garments were then used to clothe the corpses from which the whites took their grave wrappings. It would add a nice bit of symmetry, which is always something you want in a ritual. Admittedly, hobbit garments would not fit man-sized skeletons very well. I imagine Sam's waistcoat was left unbuttoned. <laughs> but for purposes of evil spellcasting, I expect it would suffice. Can I just say, I love this idea. Love it. <laughs> I don't think it's very plausible, but, I mean, come on. This is fantastic, isn't it? I mean... The idea that they've actually been swapped. So I don't know what's funnier. Um, I'm okay, like imagining the dead hands undressing the hobbits is not funny. Imagining those same dead hands then dressing, trying to put the, you know, like pull hobbit pants up onto a human skeleton. That's kind of, kind of funny, actually. Like that's 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 pretty good. And I really like the suggestion. Um I forget who was it. Zephin? Somebody made the suggestion on the discussion board that uh, that is the that really needs to be like the next, like talk about your high level, um, your high level geeky Halloween costume, right? To be an animated corpse with a, an animated human corpse dressed in Mary Pippin or Sam's Hobbit clothes, right? Go on. I mean, that would be a fan, you know, so you just have to dress as an animated corpse with like clothes that are way, way too small, uh, where that you're wearing uncomfortably, right? I mean, come on, like that's uh, that's pretty good. Um, but uh, anyhow, so uh, uh, now John uh, Castles is asking if the text claims that the clothes the whites put on the hobbits are too big for them. We don't. Well, for one thing, the clothes that they're wearing are probably um, uh, are probably. Uh, uh, like robes, right? So like the, how far they hang down past their feet isn't really clear. Um, and, um, uh, the, the one reference, the only reference to size that I can think of John is when the crown slips down over Mary's eyes, right? Which suggests the crown is probably not a perfect fit on Mary's head. Um, but, um, yeah, Matt, I agree. For another level of creepy, your animated corpse costume, you'd have to be wearing children's clothes, right, in order to make to make the effect. Um, yeah, thin white rags. So the fact that they're really ragged does not really lend itself to, like, you know, it, it's, it's not about fit, right? This is not exactly a fitting room kind of thing. Um, but um, anyway, so, uh, yeah. Anyhow, so that's um, uh, but it, but going back to that first, so I'm not I'm not sure about like the symmetry. I kind of like. I'm not sure I see the Barrow Whites. T I don't know what they did with the clothes, frankly. Um, uh, it's interesting to imagine them somehow using them as part of the ritual thing that was happening with the hobbits. I'm not sure that dressing corpses in them is what would need to happen. Um, I'm thinking uh, that it's mostly even like destroying their clothes, right? To sort of separate, I don't know how exactly a Barrow White goes about destroying clothes from a hobbit, right? But to, to sort of 
remove from them like all memory of their former you know their like actual hobbit lives right and as they're being clothed in the you know the the clothes of the dead and as they're being sort of assimilated with the dead in the graves there as we see in the incantation um that makes a certain that the, the destruction therefore makes a little more sense to me but um anyway um yeah oh matt you were thinking that the hobbits are wearing the clothes of the children that were buried in the barrow Ah, yeah, that is another level of creepy. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, so, um, yeah, very good. Um, Yeah, exactly, Mad Violinist. I do agree with Archimago's central premise here that the primary thing that Tom is sort of shielding them from here is these, you know, dwelling on uh, these sort of these thoughts and memories of evil, right? It's part of their, uh, it's part of their recovery, right? Um, and I think that that's true. Notice, of course, I think this is something that really kind of jumps out at us a little bit more, at least jumps out at me a little bit more, post Weathertop, right? As, you know, as we have been looking more carefully at the spiritual warfare that the Nazgul are, um, are waging, and which, you know, the, the sort of the spiritual counter warfare that we see, I think, Aragorn, um, at least undertaking, you know, uh, uh, back, right? Um, I, you know, looking back on that, that seems more clear, right? That, 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 that feels, uh, more, uh, more sort of obvious and, and, uh, uh, and compelling, but, um, anyway, yeah, trifle Frodo does keep his clothes. He's the one who isn't, uh, he's separated from the others. And that by itself is interesting, right? He's, uh, he's an, he's a spectator of the ritual. And of course, in the end, a disruptor of the ritual with his breaking off the hand of the white. Um, but, um, uh, but he's a spectator. Um, and so it's, it's interesting the way in which he's in another category already, which of course lends plausibility to the rings, uh, suggestion, right. That he could put on the ring and, and, and get away. Cause he's like on the outskirts, right. He's not, this isn't, this isn't about him. This is about this ritual. It's about his three friends. Um, and it does suggest, of course, right. I mean, Frodo has been taken too, but he's not been treated the same as the other three. I don't think we talked about this all that much. At least I don't remember it. Maybe it was just cause it was a year ago. Um, but anyway, um, uh, it does suggest that Frodo is, being sort of looked at differently, right? Thought about differently by the Barrow Whites, which would make a certain amount of sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Luke is saying if the, you know, is wondering if, you know, the White is sort of recognizing a kind of a higher evil power, perhaps in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I don't see any other reason why Frodo, from the White's point of view, I mean, why Frodo should be separated from the others and treated differently, right? Perhaps in some sense, the presence of the ring is detected, um, has some kind of influence on them or, or, or alters their decision in some way. Um, yeah, I don't think trifle, I would go so far as to say that the Barrow Whites know about the ring, but given that they clearly must also be operating at least partially right on that other side in that Wraith world, um, they have to have at least some connection with it, right? You'd think that they could sense it, um, or at least they could have some kind of sense that there's something different about that one, right? Different from the other three. So, and again, I can't think of anything else uh, from the White's point of view that would make that distinction. From Frodo's point of view, it seemed like he was the last one captured. But I don't know that that necessarily is true. Um, yeah, and Nathan, I was just thinking about the same thing. Could it just be a, a sequence thing? But first of all, even if he was the last one caught, why should they not include him for that reason? I mean, do, is there like, you know, a maximum of three, right? And they're like, oh, we'll just keep the oddball and do something different with him after. I mean, that's possible, but there's no real, no, no, no positive reason to think that. And secondly, again, um, he, Frodo, you know, we're seeing that scene from his point of view and all of them are separated, right? 
and he can hear some of them, he thinks, crying out in the distance. So he's probably not the first one caught, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that he's uh, that he's the last one caught either. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Trifle's suggesting, uh, he says, I wonder if the ritual's in Frodo's honor. Uh, going on the comment earlier about Frodo being an honored guest, yeah. Um, uh, Matt, that's interesting. That is another difference. Matt points out that Frodo has already been marked as an elf friend. Um, yes, yes. And that might well be something that the Barrow Whites could perceive as well, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that is another, that is, uh, you know, trying to think, I was trying to think of other, other things that might differentiate, uh, Frodo. Um, and that is one, that is one potentially. And we did talk about how people seem, some people anyway, seem to be able to recognize that. And I see no real reason why, um, it would not be true of, uh, of the Barrow Whites as well. I mean, maybe not. It seems a lot of good guys who mostly can see it. Can the bad guys see that too? I don't really know. Um, with Frodo and Aragorn, there seems to be something of a like calling to like kind of situation, right? Frodo can kind of tell that there's something about him. And we talked at the time that I do remember talking about at the time we were discussing chapter 10, um, that, you know, part of what Frodo was kind of sensing, um, you know, what, what, what felt fair about, uh, about Aragorn was that he was also an elf friend, right? Um, but, um, so, yeah, so that's possible. That's possible. Um, yeah. Oh, that's really good. Mad Violinist says, I've been waiting for you, which is what the white says to him, um, is an eerie echo of the Hey Now, Dairy Doll, We'll Be Waiting For You from Tom. Um, yeah, that's really nice, actually. Even the way Mad Violinist that shifts it from the future tense at when Tom sings it to the past tense, uh, you know, or the present perfect, technically, right? I have been waiting for you, right? The waiting is over now. This is the end of the story, right? I like that. I like that a lot. Um, but, Johannes, I agree. If I had to choose between the two of them, if I had to choose between the elf friendship of Frodo and the... Um, uh, and the ring, I would choose the ring too. And uh, Johannes makes a great suggestion. I notice, like, our attention will be drawn in several chapters to the way the Watcher in the Water singles Frodo out too. That's not going to be explained either. But I feel relatively certain that the tentacular creature from the pool in front of the gates of Moria uh, is not detecting that Frodo is an elf friend. Right. Um, so, yeah, that seems that seems very likely. Um, good. All right. Let's move on. That's enough for our throwback question for today. Now to something a little bit more au courant, as it were. So far, Tolkien has used four onomatopoetic words to describe the sound of horses on the road. Clip clop used twice, clippity-clip, clippity-clippity-clip, and clop-clop, used twice. Not sure if any of our horse experts in residence see some connection with horse strides and their accompanying sounds, but I can say two things for certain. The first is that clip-clop and clop-clop both describe the hobbit pony that Mary was riding as he met up with the others and Farmer Maggot, whereas clippity-clip and clippity-clippity-clip both describe Asphaloth approaching Strider and the hobbits. Perhaps there is some intentional word choice on Tolkien's part. I mean, come on, it's Tolkien. But I'm not sure what it would be. Hobbit ponies have shorter strides and go clip-clop and clop-clop. Elf horses go clippity for added pace. Even the hobbits could hear the difference in the type of horse when Gorfindel approached. That does not sound like a black rider's horse. And Aragorn knew instantly. One thing I know for certain, elf horses most certainly do not clop. More to the point, I am now intrigued to compare and contrast the manners in which the hobbits and later the company are approached by unknown parties before those parties are visible. So far, whenever they've heard the sound of hoofs, they feared for black riders. When the onomatopoetic words are used, it's a friendly party approaching, Mary or Gorfindel. 
However, the black riders are indicated by the sound of hoofs or the sound of horses galloping, especially when accompanied by more um, ominous phrases, as of the sound of following feet. Additionally, regarding non-horsed approaches, we've had some parties singing before they were seen, Glorfindel and Company, Bombadil, and the Ringwraith's approach without sound when unhorsed, Crick Hollow, Weathertop. I'm interested to see if any of these patterns keep up. Uh, this is a great question, and of course we will we will definitely want to uh, um, we will definitely want to keep up with the clip clop question. Uh, I, I agree, Sharon. As we as we enter Rohan, do we do we do we continue to see any trends in the equine onomatopoeia? Right. Uh, we'll definitely need to uh, definitely need to think about that. Um, I definitely agree with um, uh, the observation about clippity, and several people were echoing this. Clippity, clippity, clip suggests a both a faster and a lighter uh, pace as well. But it's the lighter thing, right? Yes, it sounds faster, um, but uh, is it just a gait thing, or is it you know that is just to indicate the gait of the horse, or is there something meant to sound sort of lighter? Uh, about the elf horse, right? I think it has to be something more than merely the gait, like telling us how fast the horse is going, because uh, as as uh, in, in the quotation that Zephan makes here, uh, sorry, I didn't attribute that, that's uh, Zephan 12, um, that um, the but again, they can tell the sound, right? That does not sound like a black rider's horse, right? Um... Lucas uh, saying, assuming the Nazgul are riding heavier, more more powerful steeds. Yes, exactly. Marianne says elves run lightly. Maybe their horses do too. Yeah, exactly. That's that that kind of it. It fits, right? It does seem to fit. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's I think a good theory. What I'm really fascinated by though is the. Um, uh, that observation, that the significance, I think, of that observation is potentially fascinating. And Zeph and I look forward uh, to, uh, I, I look forward to your follow up posts on this as we continue to track this throughout the book. I think this is fascinating. The fact that sound, so he talks about sound being associated, like, he talks about the sound of hoofs, and he talks about the sound of horses galloping, but he doesn't give us onomatopoeia, right? We don't get, you know, cloppity, cloppity, clop, or however the the black rider horses would sound, right? But we do get those sounds um, for, for Asphaloth, and I would have... I think I would have been able to get that, right? What I had forgotten is that we got the same thing about Mary's pony as well, right? So this association between onomatopoeia and good guys approaching and mere verbal description of bad guys approaching is really interesting. Um, and I want to see, I want to see if it adds to anything and I want to, um, uh, and if it does, I want to see what it, uh, what it adds up to. Um, so, uh, Yeah, um, I agree, Veronica. That seems to me most likely too that it sounds that it that it has to do with the heaviness of the horse. Though, of course, that doesn't quite explain the Hobbit pony, right? Um, who is also going clop. But um, but anyway, um, yeah. Eternal Cow says. Um, the uh, the bad guys are too serious to use onomatopoeia for right, but that's an interesting thing by itself, right? That serious that onomatopoetic words and phrases should be associated with happy things, cheerful things, amusing things, um, and not be. I would I would almost want to expand that Zephan into thinking about the overall use of onomatopoeia in Tolkien, right? Um, is there a trend? Does he tend to use direct onomatopoeic phrases to emulate sounds which are associated with goodness, happiness, relief, 
you know, all that kind of thing? Um, uh, or is it, um, or not, right? Um, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, Biotrom is remembering the drums in the deep, and that is certainly an interesting example. Um, I'm not sure it's quite the same. Well, maybe it is. Anyway, we'll see. Um, but uh, this will be fun to follow as we go through. Right? Um, yeah. And Gladys, you're right. Uh, uh, Gladys Rabbit is thinking about the uh, the Goblin song, right? With the the you know the the Black Crack song. Um, but um, yeah, JJ, that uses a lot of onomatopoeia. But that's the Hobbit, right? Um, so I, I, I would, I would discount that from this particular data set. It's hard to lump when you're talking about style, stylistic choices that Tolkien is making. It's hard to include the Hobbit in the same data set with the Lord of the Rings, just because it's not because it's inferior or anything, just because it's different. Right. And he's going for different things. But anyway, I think that's a really interesting observation. So let's see what we see as we move forward. Um, so many things for us to keep track of as we, you know, over the next 10 years. Um, cool. All right. Okay. Phew. All right. Um, let's, let's, let's go to the text. Frodo was just turning back. He had just drawn his sword with a flash of red, which we talked about last time. Ride on! Ride on! cried Gorfindel. And then loud and clear he called to the horse in the elf tongue. Norolim! Norolim! Asphaloth! At once the white horse sprang away and sped like the wind along the last lap of the road. At the same moment the black horses leaped down the hill in pursuit, and from the riders came a terrible cry, such as Frodo had heard filling the woods with horror in the east farthing far away. It was answered, and to the dismay of Frodo and his friends, out from the trees and rocks away on the left, four other riders came flying. Two rode towards Frodo, two galloped madly towards the ford to cut off his escape. They seemed to him to run like the wind and to grow swiftly larger and darker as their courses converged with his. Okay. Wheel Rider, I absolutely recommend uh, checking out if Norolim is still available as a license plate in your state. That is on my top five list for coolest license plates. Um, my number one on my list was sadly taken in the state of New Hampshire. I totally would have gotten it. Uh, my number one favorite vanity plate that I've always wanted uh, says Hrududu, uh, but it was taken in New Hampshire already. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Norolim, however, is, I think I've seen that before in some state or other, or seen a picture on, on, uh, on, on Twitter or something like that, but it's a, that would be a fantastic license plate. No question. Um, uh, it's not available in New Hampshire. Yeah. See, James, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. Um, uh, anyway. Okay. So. Glorfindel here speaks directly to the horse and tells the horse to get it. So giddy up, of course, the approximate translation, right, of uh, Norolim um, uh, into into Westron. Um, here we can see him. Um, we can see him appearing to activate the strategy that, you know, the, the sort of emergency plan that he seemed to be putting into place when he was putting Frodo on, on, on the back of the horse, that thing that I'd never noticed until we read that a couple weeks ago, um, where he seemed desirous to take it out of the power of Frodo, not to cross the ford, right? And so here we see him actually having to... Uh, uh, <laughs> Having to implement that. <laughs> Sorry, JJ, you're absolutely right. Giddy up is how Norolim would be translated into Wild Westron. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that's very good. Um, yeah. Okay, so Trifle is, is returning to our 
discussion of last week of relative positions and where Frodo is. Yes, which we need to, of course, uh, 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 reenact at Mythmoot um, in a large field. Um, Trifle says, I'm going to go with Gorfindel being behind at this point, but catching up fast. Uh, hence, he needs Frodo to start moving or the party will have to stop. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I, I, but of course, it's obviously, it's not like the party catching up with him that he's concerned about the bike riders catching up with him, right? Uh, so the mere fact that Frodo has stopped and turned around, that could, of course, just be like he's worried about his friends and doesn't want to leave them behind as he verbalized before. But I think that Gorfindel can see perfectly well and certainly guess uh, at least a part of the struggle that's going on in Frodo's mind right here. Right. Uh, and to know that he is in very real danger if he does not actually try to turn Asphaloth and join the Black Riders. I mean, he could come under the, you know, the sway, under the dominion of the Witch King at this point and then and try to join the enemy. Even if he doesn't, even if he just delays, right, even even if he is merely frozen, you know, uh, you know, sort of paralyzed as he's trying to fight off the spiritual attack of the Witch King. Um, he is nevertheless, um, you know, still making it possible for them to, for them to, to catch up with them. Mad violinist, he may well, Gorfindel may well feel the will of the Witch King at work, even though it's not being directed, uh, towards him personally. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that, um, Gorfindel, under these circumstances, is able to call to Asphaloth and, again, executes that plan that he had clearly put in place before. Um, so, we, um, well, Trifle Gorfindel doesn't, maybe, hasn't seen the riders ahead, perhaps. Um, maybe he has, you know, who knows what Gorfindel is seeing um, or sensing, right, as he's getting closer. Um, you know, more senses perhaps as we were discussing last week than merely sight inactivity for Gorfindel here. Um, but he's clearly close enough for both Frodo and the horse to hear him when he shouts, right? Um, which I think is another reason to think that perhaps Asphaloth hasn't been galloping to this point. Um, yeah, Catriona, exactly. He did comment earlier about the Ford being held against them. So he certainly suspected that there would be others lying in wait up there. Um, yeah. Okay. So ride on, ride on. So he gives two commands here, right? The first to Frodo and the second to the horse, um, which is interesting, right? Uh, it, here's why I say that's interesting. Why does he even shout to Frodo, right? I mean, he's going to call out to the horse. And what he's got, it doesn't matter whether Frodo obeys or not. In, in, like, as far as the outcome is concerned, right? If he shouts Norolim Asphaloth, Asphaloth is, is taken off, right? So, you know, shouting to Frodo would seem to be superfluous, essentially, right? But I wonder if it has something to do with... I'm inclined to think he's not just wasting his time and breath by shouting out to Frodo. John, that's exactly what I was just building up to, and JJ as well. Um, he's, he knows, because he knows or suspects that Frodo is engaged in a spiritual battle here, he cries out to Frodo, not in order necessarily, or not primarily, perhaps, um, to, uh, d you know, because he believes he's going to be able to spur Frodo to action, right? But rather because he needs help in his spiritual battle, right? So he gets Gorfindel's voice urging him, to, you know, the, you might be right now hearing a voice in your head saying the best thing for you to do would be to stop, right? Uh, I'm counseling you, right? I I'm not saying neither no nor yes. I'm counseling you very strongly. Go, right? Ride on. Do not stop. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that that would be reason enough, right? Just for him to give that final urging. Because this is also, 
the last thing he's going to be able to say to Frodo, right? Frodo's not going to be able... No, he's, he's very soon not going to be in hearing range anymore, right? So uh, the last thing he's able to say to Frodo in order to sort of bolster and strengthen his resistance uh, against the Witch King is that last urging to ride on, which perhaps, uh, you know, and hopefully Frodo can can sort of hold on to. Um, and Matt, yeah, right. Matt is reminding us that Frodo has drawn a sword, indicating that he's ready to fight, um, which is, yes, it's it's not a good idea. Well, it's not a very practical idea, certainly. Um, but uh, I, I still think, I mean, drawing his sword was a great move back in the Dell under Weathertop. Um, spiritually speaking, I still kind of like it, you know? I mean, I think it shows spirit in the right direction for Frodo, the spirit to resist the Witch King, which is a good thing. But again, like, yeah, let's stop and fight them is not, that's not a winning proposition. Uh, and so right on, right? So it, it's not, it, it might, it might be seen not only as a kind of uh, bolstering up of Frodo's will, which is at least struggling right here right but also as again a, a sort of a very unambiguous piece of advice right i okay, love the sword thing frodo great resistance but, but no go go like the the way to express your resistance most effectively is not to draw your sword in defiance but to ride like the wind right that's exactly what you really should be doing um yeah yeah um now, Wyatt asks, he's aware at this point of the river defense system. Gorfindel? I think it has to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, well, that's interesting, Karita. Karita's saying it's, it sort of reminds her of people shouting go to people in a race, right? Like, it's not like they need the information or advice, right? It's just encouragement. And so, so again, giving Frodo encouragement at this point, and, you know, there is part of you, Frodo, that is that wants to flee, right? I, I am attempting to bolster up that part of you, to encourage that, um, I do think is good. But also, again, uh, part of him needs to be even part of the good part, right? Part, you know... The part of Frodo that's resisting needs perhaps to be redirected into a more immediately appropriate channel, namely flight instead of fight. Um, now, Olway, it's not that the name of Elbereth won't work anymore, um, but um, uh, yeah, I, is Frodo even able to do that? I don't really know. Um, I kind of wonder. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just looking up and seeing uh, Iwin Dillian contemplating the the cost of getting Neuralim in Illinois, which is available. Awesome, yeah, yeah you know, it's te it's tempting, right? I mean, that's a really good license plate. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, John, I agree. Frodo, um, Frodo needs to get away, but the best possibility would be for him to ride away himself. I agree that's the best option. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. John is suggesting that Forgetting his sword and just riding away is sort of the second best option. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens when we get to the ford. We got we have a little more data to collect before we can draw conclusions about that. Um, and yeah, I agree. The the Elbereth thing, we can't start thinking about that as if it's just a spell that he can cast, right? Um, you know, it's not. You just it's just not about you know. It's not like Elbereth is the name that the Black Riders cannot hear, right? It's it's not it's not like that. Um, uh, you know, if you do not leave me and my friends alone, I will say Elbereth to you. It's 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 not how it works. Um, one of the things that we were wondering was where it came from. To, uh, you know, in that moment, Frodo was inspired, 
right to say the name of Elbereth, to call on the name of Elbereth, and to call on the name of Elbereth with power. Um, we talked about the possibility. Um, we talked about the possibility of um, it being actually part of the blessing or parting uh, part of the uh, um, the the. Yeah, it's sort of the good spell that Gildor seems to be placing on free. You know, when he when he he says, "May Elberth protect you," and we were talking about how that's probably not just a like you know, from my lips to Elberth's ears, right? He's not just a he's just uttering a prayer, right, or speaking a formula at that point, but actually conferring a blessing, which is what is getting cashed in, right? Which which is coming home to Frodo in that moment. Um, but whether Gildor's blessing is involved or whether it's Elbereth in acting independently, I don't know that it makes any difference. I think that's clearly Elbereth's action there, right? It is Varda who intervenes, and she's not going to do that, like, randomly, right? You know, she's not going to uh, do that all the time, right? So, so yeah, it's not something that you can... Um, uh, um, just pull out at need, right? Um, it's not your verbal nuclear option there. Anyway, okay. So the white horse springs away and speeds like the wind along the last lap of the road. I like the lap. Um, th I take that to be essentially metaphorical, right? It's, it's not, they're not doing laps, right? This, that's not, there's not literally a lap involved. Um, but here he is going to, he's establishing a horse race metaphor here, right? As if they are going around a track around which they're doing multiple laps, right? And this is the last lap, right? So it's the final stretch to the Ford. Um, but the use of the word lap invokes explicitly a horse racing metaphor, Right. And so he's talking, he's inviting us to think about it in terms of a race. And then we get, um, uh, then we get the, uh, the other horses, or the, the other challengers who are starting with it, with, with a head start, right. Closer to the Ford, uh, who are, who are coming in. Um, And then the, the horses come down in pursuit from behind. We know we've got the five of them uh, behind him. And then from the riders came a terrible cry. Is one of them crying? Is this just the Witch King crying out? Or are all of them crying out simultaneously? Um, I think this is... I mean, it says it comes from the riders, plural. But I, I think that just means from those you know, like from the direction of those riders that are behind them. He's... Frodo's got his back to them. Um, this has to be Frodo's narration, right? This whole sequence has to come from Frodo's point of view. Uh, so he's not looking at him anymore, right? Asphaloth has put it out of his power to carefully observe uh, the Black Riders directly behind him. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyhow, so he he hears this, the, the cry coming from uh, uh, c coming from the riders behind him. I think it's got to be the Witch King. <clears throat> and remember what we learned when we were comparing the uh, the cry, that cry in the East Farthing, when we got it. Remember that cry um, interrupts the drinking song, right? That's the, it's the cry which interrupts ho, 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 to the bottle I go. Um, and in a sense, what we were getting there, um, as we discussed a little bit at, at the time, uh, is that it's it's like um, it's like a, a song battle almost right? The hobbits are singing a very happy song right about drinking, um, and then they uh, um, and then they the, the then the 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 Nazgul cry out right, and there are words in that cry, um, and it is it is like. It is like a song itself. The way that it's described is high and sustained, but there are words in it, right? Um, so it seems very song-like as well, right? Um, and so that cry, which contains words, presumably, just like the other one does, and is clearly a signal or a directive uh, to the others, right? Um, that's when 
it was answered, right? That's when they start calling back. Um, and four other... Uh, I see we're debating about lap and especially whether it's metaphorical. Yeah, Torah Martin, that's my question. If people use the lap not the word lap non metaphorically to mean the last stretch, does it does it originate with the metaphor, right? Um Yeah, I wonder. That that would be my question too. Um anyway. Okay. Um Two rode towards Frodo. Two galloped madly towards the ford to cut off his escape. I have to admit I've never understood that. This is one of the reasons why I need to see the flight to the ford reenacted. Um, but because uh, okay. Here's my problem. Why are two of them running straight towards Frodo? If he's... So I'll do this. I'll try to do this on the on this plane. If Frodo's running towards the Ford, that two of them would take the angle uh, towards the Ford to try to cut him off makes all kinds of sense. Like, that's exactly the sensible thing to do. But the two that come towards him, if they're up here, right, and he's over here headed towards the fort, running towards him is really dumb. Uh, uh, you know, as anybody who... Uh, as anybody who, like, watches American football would know, like, when you're trying to catch somebody in the open field who's running really fast, right? You don't run straight for him. You've got to take the angle towards where he's going or there is no way you will catch up with him, right? Um, and so that just, it seems, I don't understand it. But for Thoughtless, they could be trying to cut Frodo off from the rest of his companions, but you'd think the five coming up behind would do that, right? Um, as they on their horses are going to be overtaking uh, the runners on the ground long before, right? So they will come between, and they're the majority of them, and they're five instead of two, right? So if there's any cutting off to be done, nor does there seem to be any particular reason uh, to, um, n nor does there seem to be any particular reason for them to imagine that Frodo is going to double back, right? Maybe, but again, they're not holding back and trying to box him out. They're going straight for him. They're hurting him. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what I'm trying to decide here is whether those two riders are just making a tactical mistake or not. Because um, Frodo's destination seems pretty clear. Right, he's headed for the ford. Asphaloth is burning in a straight line. Right, um, riding straight towards Frodo is the best way to absolutely guarantee you do not catch him. Right, it's not that is not okay. <laughs> right, and the thing is, like Tolkien had to know this. Tolkien was a rugby player. Right. And you catch you had you, you he will certainly have tried to catch runners in an open field before, right? Uh, so I I don't I can't imagine, um, yeah. Right towards Frodo might mean an inter uh, an intercept course, John. But again, it seems to be a bad intercept course. I mean, the two that go straight to the ford fail to intercept Frodo. Now, they clearly thought that they would, and everybody, it looked like they would, right? It's only the uh, the the uh, remarkable speed of Asphaloth that he manages to beat them to the ford barely, as we will see uh, on the next slide. But um, uh, oh, Karita, yes. Uh, Tolkien was a good rugby player. In fact, there's that one letter uh, that Tolkien wrote, which was really funny, um, that um, uh, when he went back to his old school, uh, 
I, I, for the first time after he graduated, uh, and he was kind of like, you know, apparently hoping he would be remembered for like something that he really valued, like his, you know, his, uh, uh, his literary skill or his Greek orations or something like that. And, uh, he found that the only thing he was remembered for at his old school was his ferocity as a rugby player. Uh, so yeah, apparently he was fairly good at school. Um, uh, but anyway, I do think, um, uh, I do think that they um, do seem to be caught by surprise by the speed of the horse. Um, yeah, Gravity is asking, do the Black Riders know that Frodo is on Asphaloth? Possibly they don't. Possibly they don't. Um, yeah. No, I went Dilly and I, I know they're riding towards Frodo, and I, I know I, I kind of made it look like it was a 90 degree uh, angle thing. Um, but again, like, well... I don't know. I, 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 I do feel like I'd have to do this on a whiteboard to make it, to make it clearer. But again, like if you are, if, if you're off to the side and there's somebody running really fast, you know, essentially perpendicular to your direction, like his, his, his uh, he is traveling, you know, laterally in front of you really fast. Um, and you want to catch him. It doesn't matter where his position is. The one place you don't want to aim for as you direct uh, your your attack is wherever he is. You've got to you've got to race to the spot that he's going to, right? And try to get there at the same time. You've got to take an angle on him. And they don't seem to be taking an angle on Frodo. Um, at least they can't be. At least it's a bad angle uh, because uh, the two that take the much sharper angle straight to the Ford still fail to reach it before he gets there. Um, but anyhow, um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we'll, we'll, <laughs> oh, we will definitely diagram this, uh, at Mythmoot, uh, definitely. Um, so anyway, yeah, I was, <laughs> this will all be clear when we, when we, uh, uh, when we, when we reenact this at Mythmoot. However, um, uh, I do think the theory, I, one of the conclusions which seems to me absolutely inescapable from this whole thing is that they're not only the, the, the Witch King's plan, right? The ambush that he has set up here is not only foiled by Glorfindel and Asphaloth, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's very clear, right? In, in the most superficial of readings, um, but rather they, like all of them are caught by surprise by it. Um, it's not just that Gorfindel and Asphaloth overcome them. They don't see this coming out. This is, this is an eventuality that they have not planned for. Um, and that's, I think my favorite reading, um, of the, uh, that's, that's my favorite reading of the, the two that are heading right towards Frodo is that they burst out of hiding, right? Uh, so the first thing that they do, uh, is like, they, they see a figure, which is probably Frodo and they start riding towards him, right? Thinking what he's probably on the pony. They know they've got a pony, right? Um, and if the pony is slow enough, they probably don't have to take a very good angle, right? To catch up with him. Uh, so maybe they're just sort of heading, taking a shallow angle toward him, thinking it's going to be easy to catch him. And then, holy cow, he is out of there and they're behind and there's no way they can catch up to him. Right. Um, I like that reading, uh, rather than having them actually believe they could catch Asphaloth that way. So, um, yeah. Oh, we're not going to actually bring horses to Mythmoot. We're going to have to simulate this. I think on, on, we're, I think we're going to have to do a pedestrian simulation. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we will, we will attempt to simulate, uh, somehow the, um, um, coconuts. Yeah. We'll have to bring coconuts. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of coconuts. <laughs> I think that is precisely what's going to need to happen uh, at Mythmoot. That's precisely it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, hobby horses and coconuts. Well, I'd look the, the coconuts at the very least. I'm sure we can manage. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm just seeing, uh, on one of my screens, an official note being made in the, uh, in the backstage, um, uh, 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 
uh, chat room of our Mythmood organizers. We must remember to bring coconuts to Mythmood. It's happening in real time. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, no, I know exactly, Sharon. Yeah, I just saw it come up, the post you just made. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, let's see. Biotrom, great observation there. Let's see. Uh, okay. they're, they're flying, right? The horses are flying, just like Balrogs. Um, two are riding towards Frodo and two are galloping madly towards the ford to cut off his escape. They seem to him to run like the wind and to grow swiftly larger and darker as their courses converged with his. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, uh, Brian Kelly, clearly the horses have wings, right? That's, that's, it's proven, right? They fly, right? I mean, you don't need any more, a better observation than, uh, any, any, but yeah. Uh, the fellowship does. Everybody who flies has wings, obviously. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, like the wind, Asphaloth, of course, is going to be described as, as uh, like the wind as well. Um, but um, they seem to him to run like the wind and to grow swiftly larger and darker as their courses converged with his. Growing larger and darker is sort of the interesting thing here, right? Um, uh, do you remember that really cool... This is, this is uh, one of those... Um, uh, one of those things. Oh, and by the way, yes, Marianne, uh, if, if, when this happens at Mythmoot, we will absolutely stream that. That's 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 definitely that's definitely going to happen. I'll probably end up streaming it on my phone again because we'll be outside. Uh, but that's that's OK. It, it, it will still happen. Um, this actually I find my imagination here influenced uh, I by Peter Jackson, right? Remember that really cool thing that Peter Jackson does when Frodo is on the road in the Hobbit, right before they hide down below the bank, right? When the, when the black rider is coming, um, you know, when he tells them to get off the road, uh, and the four of them are hiding beneath the road when the, when the black rider comes forward. Anyway, that moment when Frodo is looking down the road and like Jackson does that thing where it like makes the sort of like shifts the foreground and background and makes the whole thing kind of distort. That's kind of how I'm picturing him looking at the riders, right? Yes, they're getting larger because they're coming closer to him, right? But th I don't think that that is what exactly we're describing here. I mean, we don't need to be told that things look bigger as they get closer. I think that the effect um, that, uh, yeah, the Hitchcock zoom, that's exactly it. The Hitchcock zoom. That's right. Um, I'm imagining a Hitchcock zoom here. Uh, that is to say, I think that what Tolkien is attempting to is, is describing here um, is uh, some a, a, an actual like distortion of Frodo's vision here. Um, they appear to look larger because he like they're, they're like growing larger in his eyes as he's looking at them, right? Um, because they. Um, the same way that they're not actually getting darker, right? I don't, that's not like a, it's, it, it's not like a blue shift effect, right? As they're getting closer to him, uh, that they're blue shifting. And so they're looking darker again. That's not what's being described here. I think that both of those things, um, the growing larger and darker are both conveying the way in which their presence is growing more clear in, um, in Frodo's mind, right? Uh, you know, his, his perception, is changing here and they are looming larger because he can see them more clearly. Um, darker is interesting though, right? Because the shadows and shadows falling and things, it's one of the things of course that we've been looking at um, with Frodo and Frodo's progressing spiritual condition here is on, on account of his wound, right? Um, and it's interesting to me that the Nazgul uh, are um, looking darker Right. Instead of when, when he saw them, when they were revealed to him, when he was wearing the ring, they didn't look dark. They looked pale. Right. They looked not exactly luminous, but they looked um, 
uh, they looked pale. They didn't look dark. Um, so, yeah, and Ambrosius Aurelianus, that's really interesting. He says the riders are trying to take up all of Frodo's vision and attention. They want him to think only of them and not of escape. Yes, that, exactly, Ambrosius. I think that what we're seeing there is, again, I think that what's being described, it's not a physical phenomenon or a merely physical phenomenon that's being described. Um, it is a spiritual phenomenon, right? And it's not, a, and, and, but, but Ambrosius, I think your point is an excellent one. It's not only that Frodo himself is changing, right? And is kind of himself, physically he's running away from them, right? But spiritually he's drawing closer to them in a sense, right? In this moment of crisis, in this moment where he's almost being overcome by his wound. Um, but also that, that it's something active that they are doing, right? That they are trying to draw him to them, right? And so this is like the... Uh, the kind of peripheral effect of the that that thing that the ring raids are doing to him, or attempting to do to him at least, as he is fleeing. Um, Lalith is asking if that's their intent to change appearance and intimidate. I doubt changing appearance is, itself is their goal, right? But that it is a side effect of the 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 effect that they are trying to have intimidate. Yes. Um, I, I think create fear, of course, we know is one of the main things that it's, you know, their, their primary weapon, um, but also that it's, um, uh, if they are trying to kind of draw him towards them to sort of draw his attention and his focus uh, in on them, um, this, again, it seems a, a sensible way to, to do that. Um, yeah. And John, I agree. This is a very liminal space moment, isn't it? You've got, uh, we're right on the boundary, right? The Ford is, you know, being this really, really important boundary that's about to be crossed, while simultaneously Frodo is right on the boundary between the physical world and the Wraith world, right? And and in a sense, John, right, that's the real, um, that's the real race that's happening here. Or rather, you could say the physical race that's unfolding here, the race of, you know, the horse race uh, that's happening is like an outward representation of that spiritual race that's happening. Will Frodo cross the boundary into Rivendell, the place where healing is available, right? Or will the wraiths get him, right? Will he cross the boundary into the wraith world before he crosses the ford? Um, uh, and, you know, in a sense, you know, the more you think about that, John, right, the more this begins, this whole scene begins to take on this sort of quasi-allegorical overlay, right? And I say quasi-allegorical because, again, it's not, it's not a literal allegory, but this is a kind of thing which is um, a really delightful kind of level of symbolism, right? Where it, it doesn't replace, the thing that Tolkien disliked my interpretation of his objection to allegory, the thing that he disliked about allegory is that tendency to like, if you're reading an allegory, once you've cracked the code, you can ignore the story, right? Because the story is the whole point of it is just to convey the allegorical point. So once you get it, once you get the allegorical point, the story is irrelevant because its only purpose was to be the vehicle of that point. And that I think that's what he did not want people doing with the Lord of the Rings, right? Just discarding the story once you once you get the message, right, about Hitler or whatever it was, right? Um, but so and Tolkien doesn't often do that kind of allegory, um, uh, that kind of personification allegory. But this is a this is a different kind of thing, right? It's allegorical kind of thinking where you're just you're sort of taking the invisible things, the spiritual things, and you are manifesting them or kind of overlaying them with the physical things that are happening right here. So and we see this kind of thing happening a lot, right? I mean, there's there there are a lot of ways in you know there there, there are several moments when we can see the physical action that's being enacted, right, is itself sort of overlaid by a spiritual allegory, whether it's, you know, Gandalf on the bridge of Khazad-dûm or, or, you know, Aragorn uh, defying the Uruk-hai above the gates of the Hornburg, right? There's, there, there, there are many moments um, 
when uh, you know Sam advancing on on uh, on Shelob, um, there are there there are lots of moments when we get that, you know, that sort of spiritually the unseen things that are happening are really aligning and overlaying the physical things that are happening. So the whole thing um, uh, uh, comes comes in. Um, so anyhow, um, all right, cool. Um, <laughs> Awesome. So Matt has been studying lap. Hang on a second. Let me let's see. Um, so it looks like. Uh, all right. It looks like lap. It doesn't appear to be an old word usage here. So he's so so Matt. If I'm understanding you properly, it seems likeliest that when he is using the word lap here, he is using the modern horse racing metaphor, right? Is that am I am I am I am I drawing the correct conclusion uh, from your from your analysis here? I know I'm not doing it justice because I don't want to I don't want to sit here and read through everything carefully here. But anyway, that's tell t- tell me if I'm if I'm if I'm getting you right there. Um, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, cool. So okay, yeah, that would be your guess. Yeah, yeah, good. No, that's my guess too. Excellent. Hey, it looked like I guessed right. Um, uh, excellent. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, one of uh, the other MythMood organ- organizers just posted back to the primary MythMood organizer, just posted back to that same chat saying, uh, what what are we going to do next year? The ride of the Rohirrim? And I'm like, oh, I guess somebody's not actually... You can tell he's not following along with exploring the Lord of the Rings, or he would never make such a mad suggestion for next year. Uh, but anyway, sorry. Um, okay. So, yeah, notice how when you begin to think in that kind of, uh, you know, in that kind of uh, uh, an overlay... Um, uh, way right when you start uh, kind of being able to see double there to see both the physical and the spiritual happening at the same time. Uh, notice um, as their courses converged with his begins. To, I mean, that's just a description of how the horses are running, right? But of course, notice how that begins to have a kind of spiritual uh, uh, weight, right? Yes, their courses are converging with his. Right. Or rather, his course is converging with theirs. That's really the question, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> John suggests next year's reenactment will be the seating plan at the Council of Elrond. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> that seems pretty plausible, actually. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, good. One more. Frodo looked back for a moment over his shoulder. He could no longer see his friends. Ah, we'll have to remember that. The riders behind were falling back. Even their great steeds were no match in speed for the white elf horse of Glorfindel. He looked forward again, and hope faded. There seemed no chance of reaching the ford before he was cut off by the others that had lain in ambush. He could see them clearly now. They appeared to have cast aside their hoods and black cloaks, and they were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands, helms were on their heads, their cold eyes glittered, and they called to him with fell voices. Fear now filled all of Frodo's mind. He thought no longer of his sword. No cry came from him. He shut his eyes and clung to the horse's mane. The wind whistled in his ears, and the bells upon the harness rang wild and shrill. A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse, speeding as if on wings, passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> Balrogs don't have wings, who I think was formerly Olway, who I think was formerly Aragorn. Um, yeah, that he is clearly crossing into the unseen world now. We can see exactly how close this race was, right? Um, look what he is able to see, right? Um, he's able to see them, uh, their eyes, right? He can see their eyes. He can see their robes. He can see the swords in their hands and the helms on their heads. 
just like it. So it looks like he can see them almost exactly like he did uh, when he was wearing the ring, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Fourth Dauntless is wondering if this is further evidence that the swords Frodo saw in Weathertop were not real. Ah, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, Fourth Dauntless thinking about the way in which Aragorn uses the word real, right? Um, uh, you know, why could we see their horses? You know, because they were real horses, right? And they were real robes that they wear. They're not real swords, that they're wearing as far that they're using as far as we can tell. Remember the difference in the description of the knife, right? Um, and the way that the knife was was glowing. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, JJ. His vision, right? Um, I like the he turns around and he can't see his friends again, right? He can no longer see his friends. That has something to do with the fact that Asphaloth is really booking it, right? Asphaloth is, 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 is hitting high speeds right now. And so has left the sprinting hobbits far in the dust at this point. We know he's even leaving the black riders horses in the dust, right? Um, so, Anyway, yeah, that's that that's clear, but it's more than that, right? It's not just that they're so far away that he can't see them. This is about his whole vision being very strongly affected, right? Um, uh, that is that you know that he is um, that sentence. He could no longer see his friends. I mean, just take that sentence by itself, right? Um, how ominous is that, right? He could no longer see his friends. I think this is more than a physical problem, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. So, um, yeah, good. John points out that uh, the text makes it clear that his friends back there can see not only Frodo, but the riders ahead of Frodo, right? So... Um, so yeah, yeah, it does seem that it's, 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 it's not about really the distance at all. Um, it's really about, yeah, uh, uh, really a hundred percent spiritual. I can, I can get behind that. Um, so he could see them clearly now again, just like take those two sentences together. He could no longer see his friends. He could see them clearly now, right? That tells you a lot based on what we've seen about Frodo's position, right? Um, he looked forward again and hoped and hope faded. There seemed no chance of reaching the ford before he was cut off by the others that had lain in ambush. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Matt, I agree. And with Biotrom, yes, the breath of deadly cold that he feels has to be the black breath, I think. Um, a breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as with a last spurt like a flash of white fire, the elf horse, speeding as if on wings, passed right before the face of the foremost rider. He is very close. So he is probably in close to touching distance um, to the black rider. And he would have to be, um, he would have to be, um, uh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> Travel don't troll people. I can see the people who see this, the text proves Asphaloth has wigs, right? No, no, no question. Yeah. I see trifle baiting folks. Yes. Yes. Um, Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's the thing. I'm here's what I'm trying to sort through the similes. This is one of the highest 
densities of similes. Here's a challenge. Can anybody find another sentence in The Lord of the Rings which contains more different similes than this sentence does? Right? A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as, with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse speeding, as if on wings, passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Um, and yeah, they're different things, right? All three, um, all three similes are separate. So it's not one long elaborate simile, right? Um, or sort of continuations. It's three separate similes that are worked into this one sentence. Um, one of the things that I really notice about this, um, which is fairly striking, when things get really exciting... Tolkien tends to shift to a um, uh, a much more paratactic style. Um, this is a, a fun piece of vocabulary um, that I've been talking about for a lot of years. So paratactic versus hypotactic. Paratactic means basically a bunch of short independent clauses strung together, either with like periods in between or with ands in between, just conjunctions, right? Um um, the charge of the Rohirrim features this very clearly. Hypotactic means has a, a lot of like subordinate clauses and stuff like that. So long, complex, complicated sentences, uh, which kind of take a long time for their syntax to unfold. That's a hypotactic style. Tolkien uses both, right? But he tends to go towards shorter sentences or at least towards a paratactic structure. Sometimes the sentences will be long, but they will be like a string of shorter things. He doesn't usually do a lot of... Um, uh, pausing for subordinate clauses in those things, right? Um, but, um, so th that's what strikes me uh, most. That's one of the reasons why this sentence, it's not the, the imagery of the similes that really kind of uh, uh, strikes me, really, or kind of draws my attention, I guess I should say, in that last sentence. It's the it's the the rhythm of it, right? Um, notice in the paragraph before he he's already shifted into his paratactic style. Um, he could see them clearly now. They appeared to have cast aside their hoods and black cloaks, and they were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands. Helms were on their heads. Their cold eyes glittered, and they called to him with fell voices. Hear that? Bunch. Of, now, there's 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 adjectives in there. Like it's not like they're all super super simple, right? But all of those are simple. There's not a single subordinate clause. I don't think anywhere in those that set of sentences that I just read. The whole second half of that paragraph, right? He could see them clearly now. They appeared to have cast aside their hoods and black cloaks. And they were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands. Helms were on their heads. Their cold eyes glittered. And they called to him with fell voices. Fear now filled all Frodo's mind. He thought no longer of his sword. No cry came from him. He shut his eyes and clung to his horse's mane. The wind whistled in his ears. And the bells upon the harness rang wild and shrill. A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear. As, with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse speeding as if on wings passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Hear it? Hear how different the rhythm of that last sentence is? It's crazy. It, like, it never stops. Um, and I think it's really, really fun, right? Um, it's, uh, uh, he draws out that last sentence, right? Just as they're going through to the, you know, like, are they? Are they going to catch him, right? Or are they not going to catch him, right? And the, it's almost like as he's coming up, as they're as they're almost colliding, right? As as their two paths nearly intersect, right? Just barely don't intersect as he goes right in front of the face of the rider who's coming in at an angle, right? Trying to cut him off. Um, that moment dilates, right? Exactly. Tor Tora Marthen. It's like a climactic 
slow-mo shot, right? And yeah, a good, as several people are saying, it is like the commentary of a sporting match. That paratactic style, you will hear sportscasters do that too, right? Your color commentator might use uh, a hypotactic structure should he choose to, but your play-by-play guy rarely will. Right. Um, Because he's got to do rapid fire, independent clauses to convey the action to you as you go along. Right. But then that last sentence, right, that last sentence suddenly drags out. And I think it's to me, Toromarthen, exactly like the the slow motion. Right. Um, Time stops in that sentence because we've got the rhythm. We've got the pace. Right. Fear now filled all Frodo's mind. He thought no longer of his sword. No cry came from him. He shut his eyes and clung to the horse's mane. The wind whistled in his ears, and the bells upon the harness rang wild and shrill. A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as, with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse, speeding as if on wings, passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Notice that it doesn't, though, although it... The rhythm doesn't totally change, but instead of the rhythms being independent causes, the rhythms are like the similes. They're, they're the chunks of the sentence, right? Um, you, you could hear I'm doing about the same number of words, right? A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire. The elf horse speeding as if on wings, passed right before the face of the foremost rider, right? That fits, but, um, but they're not sentences. Right. It's like that one moment gets like seven beats right in the rhythm of the galloping here. Um, And Matt, it is also the moment when he's entering the river. This is not only the moment. This is the this is the moment that, you know, uh, you know, John, you were talking about the liminality of this scene. Right. This is the crisis of liminality. Right. This is the boundary. The boundary. He is hitting the boundary. Both of the boundaries are colliding him with the river. The, 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 the riders with him, right? So the Wraith world is literally closing around him and catching up with him, and he is crossing the ford, and this is the exact moment when it happens. And when it does, we get that expansion, right? This particular moment is dwelt on in this highly unusual way, which breaks the structure. It doesn't quite break the rhythm, as I said, which is pretty cool. Um, I mean, talk about having your cake and eating it too. How do you do that? Right? How do you be like, on the same time, I'm going to do this, I'm going to totally change my approach to sentence structure here, but I'm going to keep it the same rhythm too. Right? I mean, who can do that? Right? That's amazing. <clears throat> so yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so he, he does both. And what he does also, and Matt, I think you said this a couple minutes back, by having, uh, by stringing all of those similes together, right? Comparing all those different things to different things. Um, the uh, pierced him like a spear, f- like a flash of white fire, speeding as if on wings. Um, it's like, uh, you know, I think, Matt, I think this was you who said it was like sensory overload, Right. Um, like Frodo being overwhelmed by all of these things at once, which, again, is like this moment when he's crossing over. Right. Um, when he's crossing over the boundary um, that, you know, think of the, these things that are competing at once. On the one hand, you have the rider and the black breath. Right. So we have the most focused version of the power of the wraiths over him. Right. You know, you've got this one last reaching out by the wraith world to try to grab him and keep him there, right? And pull him back into it in the 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 breath of deadly cold that's piercing him like a spear to either kill him, right? To do him in, to finish him off with his wound um, or, you know, and thereby uh, keep him and drag him back into the wraith world. But then you also have like a flash of white fire, right? You've got the white fire, which was like Glorfindel, right? So we have this, the other side of the wraith, of the wraith world, um, uh, what is being compared to a flash of white fire, by the way? If you were diagramming this sentence, which would be super fun, incidentally, if you were diagramming this sentence, what is like a flash of white fire attached to? Yeah, the spurt, technically, right? Asphaloth, of course, more or less, right? Uh, uh, 
a, with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse. So is it the elf horse? The elf horse is like a flash of white fire? As with a last spurt. Because with a last spurt is also a prepositional phrase, right? But with a last spurt is adverbial, so therefore it would modify past. The elf horse passed with a last spurt, right? Um, like a flash of white fire, which is that's an actually, actually an interesting question uh, on its own. Is like a flash of white fire? Is that an adjectival or an adverbial phrase? That is to say, is it modifying the horse? Is the horse like a flash of white fire, or is the passing of the horse? like a flash of white fire. See, exactly. It depends on what it modifies. So which one is it? Right? The horse is indeed white, and the whole flash of fire thing should remind us of the red flash of Frodo's sword, right? Which already, I, you know, as I was arguing last time, I, I was connecting that with the kind of spiritual perception. Like, that, you know, it looked red when he was wearing the ring, right? So, um... Okay, so, um, and I mean, comparing Asphaloth, the horse himself, right, to Whitefire seems perfectly sensible, right? What I'm trying to do right now is two things at once. I'm trying to answer two questions. A, is it the horse or the passing? Is this an adjective or an adverb? And B, why does it matter? Because I'm pretty sure it does, but I'm not yet sure I can explain uh, why it does. I'm pretty sure it does. But let me see if I can work out why. Okay. Okay. A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse speeding as if on wings. That modifies the horse, clearly. Passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Okay. Um... Yeah, uh, Corey, I'm wondering about that too. White flash from whose perspective is one of the things that I think I'm thinking about. Um, does it look like a white flash to the ring wraiths, or is it to Frodo? Um, I'm leaning towards that like a flash of white fire is adverbial modifying the passing. And the reason... Oh, by the way, yeah, legal action, you're absolutely right. The last spurt um, does carry on the racing metaphor, right? That's, that's, very, that's horse racing language. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Cecilia is asking, does what you know? Does white fire beat black breath? Yeah, um, uh, white fire uh, uh, beats cold spear, right? Two of those metaphors, are of co or two of those similes, rather, are in fact of different things, but they're not just of different things; they're of competing things, right? Absolutely. Um, here's the difference. I think I've put my finger on why I think it matters, whether it's an adjective or adver adverbial phrase. The reason it matters to me is that if it's adjectival, it is more superficial. 
That is, it describes the horse. Yes, a white horse moving very fast, seen from the side, is going to look like a white flash, which maybe could be kind of like fire. So white flash, you know, flash and white then become merely descriptions, right? Just just telling us what it looked like. But I don't think this is just about what it looked like, right? Um, I think there's more to it than this, especially since, again, like the, the flash of white fire is reminding me of the red flash, right, from Frodo's sword. That is to say, I have the sense that this this simile is conveying, it is not just a random comparison for color to tell us what the horse looked like at this moment. I think that, again, something spiritual is being conveyed here, right? Um, so, j again, just as something spiritual is being conveyed with the red flash from Frodo's sword when he drew it, right? So, again, if it's merely a description of the horse, it seems to me less significant. Um, sure, it, it, I mean, no, it, grammatically, literally, of course, it can't be both. Um, it can be both. What I'm saying is I don't think it's just a description of what one would see there, right? Um, it's not a physical description. It's a spiritual description in that As with a last spurt, the passing right before the remember with with a last spurt is modifying the the is is modifying past as well, right? Um. So I'm trying to articulate what I'm trying to get at here. Well, okay, no, first I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to get at here, but. Asphaloth does something. Something happened here. Something happened here which is more than just the horse is running really fast. Something is happening here more than merely this fast horse, which was already running really fast, dug deep and started running even faster in that moment. I mean, that is happening. I'm not questioning that basic fact. What I'm saying is that's not enough, right? Um, I don't think that that does not strike me as an adequate description for what's happening here. Um, notice all those sentences that I was just reading really fast, right? To talk about the rhythm of the lines, right? Let's back up for, for a second, right? And actually look at those. From when the Black Riders appear to him. Well, no, from right before that. He looked forward again and hope faded. Now, remember, the arising or fading of hope we have seen, that has been a, a, a very typical characteristic of the spiritual battle from the beginning, right? Whenever, it's, I mean, well... And by the beginning, I mean Weathertop, right? Um, hope has always been a, 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 a sort of a signal of that kind of thing, right? So, okay. No problem. All right. So we see, um, uh, we see a, uh, uh, un, a sort of a blanket indicator, right? Um, that uh, uh, his, he is under attack again. Right, his hope is going down. There seemed no chance of reaching the ford before he was cut off by the others that had lain in ambush. Right, uh, Frodo sees the angles, right, and is like, "We're not making it. They're gonna get there first. Right, um, and then what immediately happens? That's when we get the description of the Black Riders. That's when he's seeing them clearly, and of course, that's significant because he's seeing them. Right, um, but more than that." Again, the very description of them is like itself a reflection of that spiritual attack on Frodo. This is what he's uh, fixated on here, right? Um, he could see them clearly now. They appeared to have cast aside their hoods and black cloaks. They're uncloaking themselves, right? It's not just that he can see underneath their cloaks now. 
which was the, which was the case in the Dell under Weathertop. They have thrown back their cloaks. Why have they done that? Right. They are revealing themselves. They are putting forth their power. And they were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands. Are they real swords? No. Like, are Mary and Pippin in any danger of being run through by these swords? Probably not. They're probably insubstantial, like the wraiths themselves are insubstantial. But that doesn't mean that the swords are not, in this sense, um, real. Right? The, re, would Frodo be run through if one of them stabbed him with these swords right now? I wonder. Right? Perhaps so. But in any case, at the very least, these swords are, again, like expressions of the will and power of the riders. Right? Of the Nazgul. Swords were naked in their pale hands like their uncloaked persons. Helms were on their heads. Their cold eyes glittered and they called to him with fell voices. They are calling out. They are acting on him, right? They are They are definitely interacting with him spiritually at this point. So we get this this several sentence description. Not Again, it was just not just a physical description, not just a, an, about their appearance, right? And look what happened. And now, meanwhile, what's happening to Frodo, right? While this is all happening, fear now filled all Frodo's mind, right? That's he is he's going under, right? He's crossing the boundary. He thought no longer of his sword. The defiance, the resistance is gone. No cry came from him. He's not shouting back in defiance anymore. Um, So we get three quick sentences, all three of which repeat Uh, hope faded, right? No cry came from him. He shut his eyes and clung to the horse's mane. That's at least kind of a good sign. Um, And a reminder, what is the one thing he has? What is the only thing connecting him with the world of light? The horse, right? The elf horse of Gorfindel is his own, is his last connection to the way, not just again, literally from a locomotive standpoint, his only hope of physically getting across the Ford. Um, it is also like his lifeline to light and hope and all of the good things, right? So he's clinging to the horse's mane. The wind whistled in his ears, and the bells upon the harness rang wild and shrill. Remember, we talked about the horse's bells before, and we even talked about how bells are often associated with, um, uh, are often associated with, um, uh, are like as being hostile to evil creatures, uh, and to, you know, to, 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 to devils and of course, and to, to wicked fairies as well. Um, but, um, anyway, um, the fact that they sound wild and shrill again, I think that's to Frodo in front. I think we're hearing Frodo's point of view here. Um, uh, it's interesting to me. Right. And now when you've got a horse who's galloping as fast as this and he's got bells on. Yeah. The, those bells are going to be going absolutely crazy. Right. So wild and shrill on the one hand is simply an effective uh, description of what they doubtless would have sounded like, but it's interesting to me that it sounds shrill in Frodo's ears, right? The bells are no longer euphonious to him. Again, as they, as if there is any kind of power, you know, even a sort of a mild and indirect power in the bells of Asphaloth's harness, um, they might be antipathetic to, uh, to, to Frodo in his current state, right? Um, anyway, A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear as with a last spurt, um, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse speeding as if on wings passed right before the face of the foremost rider. Um, Again, back to that white flash, right? That white flash from the white elf horse, which is his last lifeline to light and life. Um, It doesn't look like he's going to make it. And then he does, right? Um, That flash of white fire, and as uh, Matt was just reminding us, somebody had pointed this before, uh, pointed this out before, Frodo has closed his eyes, right? The flash of white fire. Um, Now, it doesn't say that he physically sees um, 
doesn't say that he physically sees a, a white flash, right? But again, that's one of the factors of this scene, right? The line between the physical and the spiritual, that's a, one of the, that's the boundary that Frodo is so close to, right? Is, which he's almost crossing. Um, he doesn't have to have his eyes open. It's not about what he can see with his physical eyes. Would anybody else present see uh, a, a flash of white light here? Uh, a flash of white fire? I don't know. Um, but it seems to me that Asphaloth puts on the spiritual as well as the physical afterburners here, right? Um, and that white fire does seem to be, and especially I come back to it again, this is um, what several of you were already pointing to, um, the uncoincidental correspondence uh, between the cold spear and the white fire, right? Um, as if the... Um, uh, the white fire of Asphaloth is designed to counteract the deadly cold uh, of the breath of the Nazgul, um, so that his physical speed is helping Frodo to to get across the ford. His this, um, uh, you know, the spiritual thing, right? Um, that Asphaloth is doing also helps him to not get caught on this side of the boundary, spiritually speaking, either. Um, I, I just think in this scene, as, you know, John, using, again, your, your phrase from before, John, which is very apt, this is a complete, this is all about liminal spaces. This whole section is all about boundaries, right? Um, and the crossing of boundaries. And this is the moment. This is the boundary. This is the instant when the boundary is crossed, and um, and 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 decided which 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 side of the race is going to win. Which boundary is going to is going to be crossed first? And in the end, um, Asphaloth manages to make it be the Ford. And so I just I see that that flash of white fire as being a really significant. Um, uh, being a really significant uh, 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 spiritual moment there. Um, yeah. Um, notice another thing here. Speeding as if on wings. That's the third simile. We get the two like similes. Um, like a spear and like a flash of white fire. And then speeding as if on wings. Now, those are not the same kinds of similes, right? We have an as if and a like and two likes, right? But um, as if on wings, right? Seems superfluous, right? We've already conveyed. I, I get that Asphaloth is moving very fast at this point, right? Um, I don't know that we need to know that. Or here's another another way to say what I'm getting at here. Again, the flash of white fire, like a flash of white fire. The elf horse speeding as if on wings. I don't think that those second, like the second and third similes in this sentence are merely redundant. You see what I mean? Um, that's why... I think I'm so resistant to the idea of like a flash of white fire being an adjectival description of the horse, right? Just comparing, saying what the horse looked like, right? Um, but if instead it's describing the verb, it's described passed right before the face. He passed before them like a flash of white fire, right? It's about, it describes, it gives us more information about uh, his movement, about his running, about this crossing, right? Um, as if on wings um, is about his speed, right? That's, that's, that's conveying how fast he's going, um, which again suggests to me that like a flash of white fire is not designed primarily uh, to tell us how fast he's going, besides which Fire 
Have you ever used that as a speed metaphor in your life? You ever been tempted to use that? I mean, maybe if you talk about something spreading really fast, you'll talk about spreading as fast as a wildfire, maybe, right? Um, but rarely do you say, like, it moved as fast as fire, right? Like, that's, how fast was it? It was fast like fire. I'm not saying it's impossible to use that simile, but see, flash, that's different, though. A flash is different from fire. Um, yeah. See, yeah, again, I resist the, like, fire painted on the sides of vehicles. Fire is painted on the sides of vehicles to suggest rockets, right? But it is clearly not rocketry that we're thinking of here. Um, wildfires do move quickly. Yes. But, like, a runner is rarely compared to fire, right? But Biotrom, yes, the Nazgul do not love fire, right? Um, see, I, you guys are thinking about Flash, but Flash is not the metaphor here, right? Flash is a different simile. Um, I mean, like a flash of white fire. Um, it's not exactly... Hmm. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm trying to think this through here. The association between flash and fire is about fire, which is suddenly there, which is there and is not, right? Um, a flash is fast, not in the sense that it is moving, right? Like moving from point A to point B really quickly in space. Flash is about a fire flashing in time, right? That is, there's no fire, and then, whoomp, there's a fire. Like Gandalf's fireworks. Yes. Um, the flash of lightning is very fast. It, exactly, Luke. It's about suddenness. It's not about linear speed. That's one of the things that I'm trying to get at here. That's why this, this simile seems to me both important and strange, and why I'm trying to folk, trying to figure this out, right? It's not a, you don't use that comparison for linear speed, even when you're calling somebody like a, a racer Flash, or like the Marvel character the Flash. He's called the Flash because he gets from one place to another, like whoop, there he is, and there he's not, right? Again, it's the Flash is called the Flash because he's so fast; it does he doesn't even appear to be crossing linear distance. Right? First he's here and then he's there. Boomp. Right? Like, um, yeah, I know, is a DC character. Sorry, Sam. Right. Not the Marvel character, like the DC character. Yes. Uh, I know. We've <laughs> been corrected all the time. Sorry. Veronica, see, you got me in trouble. I, I was just reading your, your comment there. Yeah, no, no. DC. I know. I know. I know. Um, anyway, sorry. Point is, <laughs> point is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about suddenness, right? Um, not about comparing something that you are seeing going very fast, right? The speeding as if on wings, that's what conveys the linear speed of the horse, right? That's what invites us to um, uh, um, to Imagine how fast Asphaloth is running at this moment. The spurt of his passing, right? The, sp the passing before the face of the rider is what is like a flash of white fire. 
He passed right before the face of the foremost rider, like a flash of white fire. Right. Um, yeah, so Brian says, so why is it relevant that it all happened in an instant? Brian, to me, I think I would say, because this is the instant, right? This is the... This has been about the crossing of boundaries. This has been a race to the boundaries. Or as somebody, forget who it was, uh, the, the boundaries are racing towards Frodo. It's almost like Frodo is standing still and the boundaries are racing to him, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, he... Yes, because it's not only the verb. It's important that it's adverbial not only because it's modifying the verb passing, but the whole phrase passed right before the face of the foremost rider. How did it pass before the face? Like a, it was. It's like a flash of white fire, um, which in the, so and because and all of these things are happening at that one moment, which is the moment of the boundary crossing, right? the deadly cold piercing him like a spear, the flash of white fire from the horse, those two things coming together into conflict as he's passing, as the, he, the horse, is passing right before the face of the foremost rider. The face of the foremost rider, of course, recalling the faces of the riders described in the previous paragraph, recalling, therefore, their power, their terror, right? The, the, the might that the riders themselves are putting forth as they are calling to Frodo with their fell voices and try, you know, the, the, again, this is that other boundary, right? Um, that's what this race is. This race isn't about horses, right? In the end, this race is about that spiritual race um, and their faces and their breath, right? And that cold spear, that is, that is the one side, right? And the flash of white fire, notice it's the only thing, Right? in the middle of this sentence. This sentence, this long, weird, important sentence, begins and ends with the riders, right? With the faces of the riders, the breath of deadly cold and the face of the foremost rider, right? Um, in between the rider's breath and the rider's face, there is only one thing, right? That lifeline that Frodo is clinging to, the flash of white fire, the sudden burst, uh, which is like that spiritual, which is both uh, the physical burst of spurt of speed, but also this sort of spiritual burst of light and power, uh, which is the one thing, again, Frodo's, all of his actions <clears throat> show hopelessness, right? From his uh, fear filling his mind, his thought no longer on his sword, uh, no cry coming from him, him shutting his eyes, right? All of those things, right? Um, there's only one, uh, in, in, in the midst of all of these things, there's only one of his actions which is in any way, and it's the clinging, right? The clinging to the horse, and it is from the horse that we get his white flash of fire. Um, uh, and it is, it, we're not going to get time because it's, we're out of time now. But of course, if we look, as we see, and when we look ahead, Frodo hears the splash of water is what immediately happens, right? As this happens, going right before the face uh, of the foremost rider, he is immediate, he is in the fort, right? That is the boundary. Um, crossing his face uh, is crossing the boundary and he hears this splash of water, right? So yes, Asphaloth is that spurt speeding as if on wings is into the water, is into the ford. Um, it is the very boundary. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Arden Cran is, you know, thinking about the uh, sort of light at the end of the tunnel thing, uh, you know, from near-death experiences. It's it's almost like that, right? I mean, it's like it is it is it is the last um, it is the last hope. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Okay. We should uh, we should stop there at the crossing of the boundary, right? And the reaching of the ford. Let's see. So, uh, we did two. Well, two is good. Two is a good number. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that leaves four more slides. I was hoping to finish next week. We'll see. Maybe that will happen. Um, yeah, I'm actually really hoping to finish next week because I won't be here in two weeks. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I won't be here in two weeks. On the 12th of February, that's the night I'm going to be down in New York uh, moderating that panel on the Tolkien exhibit at the Morgan Library. Um so I'll be, yeah, I'll be in New York in two weeks. Um, so I won't be able to have class in two weeks. I was kind of hoping to finish book one before we got there. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Thanks for being patient with me. Uh, and, so, you know, as I've said it before, uh, and this to me is what I really uh, have been enjoying doing with you guys. Um, A lot of times since my Hobbit book was published in 2012, people will, you know, say very kind things about my book and that they really liked it and that, you know, they really appreciated like my insights on the Hobbit and stuff. And, and so, you know, sometimes people will say something like, you know, uh, you know, how do you do, how, how do you do this? How do you notice all these things? Um, you guys know <laughs> like this 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 is it like i i it takes me a, like I, sometimes i will have like an inspiration right and i'll be like you know van helsing and be like you know the lightning flash shows all the leagues right occasionally that will happen but that's not usually how it happens usually how it happens is me just sort of sitting here and beating my forehead against this until i figure out what it, how it all seems to work and what seems most likely. Um, but, um, yeah, exactly. Tor, uh, uh, Torah Marathon where we're walking to Mordor one sentence at a time. Um, somebody should plot. I'd love to see a line graph of our progress through the fellowship of the ring so far with chapters, book chapters on the X axis and number of class sessions on the Y axis. I'd be kind of interested to see that line graph. Um, anyway, it's all good. It's all good. Um, all right. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. So I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter, as always. It's field trip time, so we're going to... Uh, um, we're going to... Uh, switch, uh, so we're going to switch over, uh, completely to, well, we'll still be in discord too, but so I'm going to, I'm going to shut off Twitter. Come join us on twitch.tv slash signum you, if you would like to join us for the last bit. Um, but, uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so I'll see you guys. Uh, good night. Thanks everybody for joining us there. And we will shift over to in game now. Uh, uh, Valor is not able to make it to join me here tonight. Uh, she is ill again she's had terrible luck uh with uh flu stuff this year so far um so uh we will hope that she feels better for next week um uh, whoa evil dr cannon you have that already that's amazing all right hang on i need to here it is all right hang on oh and i just Hang on. Wait a second. Let me, let me show this. That's totally, that's totally worth looking at. Check this out. Okay. Wow. Look at that. So we're at 15 class sessions on a knife in, on the, well, no, flight to the Ford. We're, we're going to equal a knife in the dark. Um, and we're going to surpass it. We're going we're gonna to get at least 16. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Because I think this was class number 15. I've got that written down somewhere. Yeah, so this was class number 15. So we've just now equaled A Knife in the Dark. Um, interesting. It's the... Uh, it's the uh, what's the what's the red line? Oh, the red line is pages per week. Oh, I see. Right. Wow, what got into me at the sign of the prancing pony? That's inexcusable. Wow. 
How do we do that? It's a pretty uh, steady march upward until we got to the Prancing Pony. Remarkable. Anyway... <laughs> Thank you. So I did not expect quite so thorough or so instantaneous an answer to that appeal. <laughs> but uh, uh, awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, that was really cool, Evil Dr. Cannon. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bricktails is right. If you could post that in the uh, uh, in the forum, that would be really cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. We left Tom Bombadil. That's why we sped up. So yeah, trifle. Maybe it's maybe it has to do with uh, like the time time uh, time dilation, right? You know that it's, it's you know we, you know we were talking about how like in the you know in the old forest it was like you know being in this fairy other world, and then we returned to the real world, and time started going at a, at a normal pace. Maybe that affected our discussion as well as we got to the sign of the prancing pony. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with that. Bricktail suggests this does not uh, uh, promise well for our time in Lorien. Uh, I, I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, you know, we're almost done with uh, with book one there. So, yeah, that is awesome. Oh boy, line and bar graph. That was cool. Okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna start our field trip. And we're gonna head back to. Um, I mean, troll shaws, of course. I want to go back to Giant Valley here today, which is where we ended last week, um, uh, and uh, uh, and go back because uh, something was occurring to me today. So, all right, so let's head off uh, as we've been doing before. We will go. Uh, by way of Ostgaruth until that fine day when we actually get to Rivendell uh, and descend into the Valley of Elrond, and then we will um, uh, be able to take a Stable Master straight there. Okay. I'm going to go this way, as is my want. Um, all right. So. Cool. All right. Yeah, trifle. Well, time speeds up in Lorien. It depends on your point of view, right? Um, yeah. Well, anyway. Um, okay. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, troll shots. So here was the idea. Um, here was the idea that I had about. Um, uh, Giant Valley. So I was thinking about, I was pondering Giant Valley and the Troll Shaws. On the one hand, Giant Valley seems like the most obviously non lore based section of the Troll Shaws, right? Everything else has some kind of at least sort of approximate. I don't know if justification isn't quite the word that I'm looking for, um, but um, explanation, at least, right? Um, you can see what they're extrapolating from. And we've been looking at this in terms of the... Uh, uh, we've been looking at this in terms of the... Um, Arnorian history, of course, uh, has been a major focus of our attention. We've also been looking at this in terms of um, the. What do you need? Okay, no, I'm not traveling here. Tempted, though I kind of am. Um, right. Yeah, so you can look at it from the point of view of Arnorian history. We we were thinking about. Um, things like, you know, Eregion down to the south. Um, we were looking at um, the, you know, that outpost, Thornhod, which is, of course, not mentioned in the books, obviously. Um, but again, this idea of 
an outpost that would be used by the you know the scouts of Rivendell would be fairly accustomed to this area, right? Obviously, so you know it makes sense to sort of see their presence there, looking at the the dark influences that we've you know that we saw, especially up in the what is it called the Nindalf, that northern section of the Trollshaws, uh, which seems to have kind of fallen under a shadow, not quite as strongly as. Um, you know, Gartha Garwin had done, but we're, we were seeing some evil influences up there uh, when we were traveling around up there and looking at, like, uh, up where the the uh, the wood trolls were, which wood trolls seem to be kind of a bad sign on their own, right? Um, so again, lots of things that are, of course, not mentioned or discussed at all in the book, but interesting ex- extrapolations of the kind that are, are always done in Lotro. But Giant Valley... Um, Oh, right, that's not the... Yeah, the Nindalf is somewhere else. What, what is it called? It's something like that, though. It reminds me of the Nindalf trifle. It always made me think of that. What's it called? Somebody somebody remind me what that area in northern... Uh, uh, the northern Trollshaws is called. I'm sure once I find out, I will remember why I'm always reminded of the Nindalf. Um, anyway, um, the but Giant Valley seems like a weird and unusual kind of stretch, right? Like, why should there be? Gladalf, thank you. Yes, that's what it is, Gladalf. That's it, Toromarthen. Yep, Gladalf. Um, yeah, it's the Delf, of course, that always made me think of it. Right. Um, anyway, as I say, all of those other areas of the Trollshaws are either, like, directly connected to things from the book, like Troll you know, the, the value of the trolls and the, the presence of the trolls, uh, again, can be, you know, connected with, uh, you know, Bilbo's trolls and stuff. And the fact that trolls have, are returning again, this time armed with dreadful weapons, um, and all that. Um, but Giant Valley, again, what's the, uh, what's the explanation for Giant Valley? Why Giant Valley? Why say we're going to invent a random place where there are giants and dragons um, in the Trollshaws? And not just in the Trollshaws, but quite close to Rivendell. Now, on the one hand, there's a sort of simple material answer to that question, right? Um, That is, there's a... uh, um, Like, it's... by material answer, I mean, well, it's up, it's near Rivendell because it's up in the mountains, like Rivendell is up in the mountains, right? And I'm going to miss the path again because these stupid bushes. Um, uh, and, be, you know, so because it's giants, right? And we know giants live in the mountains, and that, of course, is, is, that makes sense, right? It makes sense because um, it's in the book, right? They're giants in the mountains, right? Well, it's in The Hobbit anyway. So, you know, they work with that uh, uh, in the game, which seems to me totally fair. Um, so, okay, <clears throat> I can I can, I can, can see that, but it still, to me, doesn't... Ex- there's a difference between the mountain... The, the giants who are, roaming around, who are roaming around up in the passes of the mountains, up in the Misty Mountains behind Rivendell, um, and the... The fact that we see a val- a hidden valley with giants and dragons in it, right up near Rivendell. Now, Matthew, I absolutely agree that giants and dragons are cool. And I'm not saying that you need a larger justification than that to build a valley full of them in a game. Well, no, but I am saying that, actually, because that's a kind of thing that the Lotro developers very rarely do. Very rarely do they just plop in something because it would be, like, random and cool. Um, there is almost always an in-world explanation of it, right? Um, and even when, as is, you know, the case in such a large percentage of Lotro, by necessity, right, by definition. Oops, I just changed myself to walking, which I don't want to do. Um, anyway, um, so it, not only, um, I, yeah, it, there's usually something somewhere in the text, even if it's only indirect or metaphorical, which at least 
implies or suggests something that would, you know, back it up. Um, something that they're running with from the text. Giant Valley. I can, again, I can make that kind of argument for everything in the Troll Shaws, except for Giant Valley. I'm not saying that that um, bothers me. It doesn't exactly bother me. But it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder why to do that. And tonight I was thinking of an answer to that for the first time. I came up with an answer, which I'd never thought of before. Um, my yeah. Pokemojo, you're right. I could just slow travel to Rivendell and then stop at Giant Valley, I suppose. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but anyway, here we are to the Ford. Yeah, see, we can't really reenact things at the Ford in game because of the scale thing, right? I mean, where were the Black Riders hiding? Like up here? They were on the left, right? Is this where they were? Up here? Now we now entering High Moor? Really? Okay. So like, is this where the bike riders were hiding? The, the, the four, right? And so they were like, yeah, we're riding down towards the ford and intercepting Asphaloth. But where was he? Like up here. So yeah, it just like, it doesn't really work. You can't really, it's hard to do that whole liminal thing because it, the distances matter, right? Um, since we don't even get a really clear tunnel opening or anything, it's hard to, it's hard to see how it would work. So an in-game reenactment is clearly going to be insufficient in order for us to really, to really get all this. Okay. Anyway. Um, let's go on to Giant Valley. So here's my Giant Valley idea. The thing that occurred to me when I was thinking about Giant Valley before our session tonight uh, anticipating going there is the thing which sort of seemed really obvious and which I'd never really thought about before and that is um, or I should say and yet I had never really thought of it before um, and that is the parallel right so okay you're going towards Rivendell this secret valley which contains very powerful, good creatures, right? And evil does not come into that valley, right? And then you have, down the block, right, this other valley, um, which is also a secret valley, which is kind of hard to find. Um, especially now that they put all these bushes in the way. Uh, remember last week I rode right past the opening to Giant Valley and didn't even notice that I'd done that. Um, anyway, um, the uh, um, so you've got this other secret valley that's full of um, evil things, right? Full of dragons and giants. Um, and the parallel I found really interesting, you know. Um, are we supposed to sort of compare and contrast? Are we supposed to imagine these two things? The, the parallel seems to me like an invitation, right? So I'm keen to take up the invitation here. Um, okay, there's the... That means... The, okay, that the entrance to Giant Valley is going to be right up around the corner here somewhere. Or I'm not going to see it. There it is. Okay. Yeah, I missed it in the bushes last time. Okay. So now we come and we come over the lip here and we look down into Giant Valley. And, wow, there's like no... Somebody already kill all the dragons? Okay, there's one. 
an enraged mountain drake. Hi there, enraged mountain drake. You look relatively calm. Uh, right now you're a little angrier. Okay. And then we've got these worms. What kind of worms are these? Rock worms, crawling rock worms. And then we've got the giants as well. Where are the giants? And we've got the, oh, there's this ant over here, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he's a, he's a quest figure, but he's a, an ant who has some difficulties. Okay, so we come down into this valley. We see, I don't know, we're not seeing any giants, mostly dragons here at first. Um, but dragons! Why dragons? Right? Um, so, are dragons and giants evil? Mudmore asks. Sort of. Right? Sort of. Um, dragons? Yes. Definitely. And that's what we see first. Um, so, here's one of the other things that strikes me about the kind of parallel here. Um, oh, wait, I forgot. There's a giant with, a, with some architecture up here. Um, One thing that suggested the parallel, too, is that I've always associated Rivendell with dragons. And the reason I associate Rivendell with dragons is from the appendix, where Gandalf says that that would have been... The, so, had Smaug not been defeated um, before the Battle of Five Armies, um, if Bard doesn't shoot Smaug... So if Thorin Oakenshield doesn't undertake his quest and none of that stuff happens, uh, and the great Bilbo Baggins get involved, or I should say the magnificent Bilbo Baggins get involved, um, if none of that happens, um, then... Remember Gandalf explains what's going to happen, right? Um, and what's going to happen is the dragon is going to be used as, like, uh, Sauron's right hand and specifically, fire and death in Rivendell um, is what he was planning, right? There might have been no queen uh, in Gondor, he says. Um, Rivendell was at least one, if not the primary target of, um, of Smaug. And that, of course, itself is kind of like a fulfillment, right? Remember that um, we are invited to sort of connect Rivendell and uh, Gondolin, right? As it's in, um, it's in Rivendell that the blades are revealed to be blades from Gondolin, and uh, and you know we first really kind of hear about Gondolin and Bilbo's memories of Gondolin in Rivendell and the Hobbit, um, and and that's even before, of course, you know we eventually go on to learn that Glorfindel was like, you know, we've got the Glorfindel connection with Gondolin, obviously, um, strengthening it much more. Uh, uh, much more clearly and, and absolutely trifle the whole hidden valley thing um, you know uh, secret stronghold and not only secret stronghold but like secret refuge right uh, which is again very Gondolin right uh, and the enemy doesn't know exactly where it is and all that um, and of course it was destroyed in large part by dragons uh, so again that, that, that seems kind of you know poetic and everything there. So for these reasons, I've always associated Rivendell with dragons in the first place. So that we come into this this other valley, right? This like alternate valley, um, which is not Rivendell. And what we get as soon as we cross the border, right? And start wandering down are dragons, right? So uh, that seems to me to kind of set the tone, right? This is the, this is the evil valley. Evil, you know, evil does not come there into Rivendell. Uh, well, no, apparently because it's living down the block here uh, in this valley. Um, the alternate, the un-Rivendell here, right? Now, I will concede, um, uh, Bruinier, that there is at least one, uh, th there seems to exist 
some giants who are more or less decent, according to Gandalf, right? So giants need not necessarily be evil, even, of course, the giants that they meet who are chucking boulders around are not necessarily evil giants, right? Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we can't really rule that out. That there could be good giants. Okay. I'm looking at our giant's house here. Slabs of rock. Are these stones cut? They look like it, yes. Look at how they're squared off on the corners here. These are cut stones. And the giants probably cut them themselves? Who else would have had the technology to do that, Corey? Well, you know, they could have dismantled them from other structures, right? And repurposed them. If they tore down a large wall, right, they could have. But, um, yeah, exactly, Catron. They'd qu quarry them from nearby ruins. But I don't think so. For two reasons. One, because... The blocks are way too large, I think. Even yeah. the Gondorians didn't go for single blocks that big. Yeah, exactly. We don't. We haven't seen that kind of thing, and we have seen one hundred percent of the ruins in the Trollshaws so far have still been. Oh, into the cookpot with you. Um, have still been uh, Arnorian ruins, right? And yes, we have not seen any Arnorian ruins with blocks that size. Um, I also do assume that the, you know, these blocks with the triangle holes cut out of them were probably deliberately cut in order to accommodate the cross beam for this giant soup pot, um, rather than merely being two upright blocks that happen to have triangular holes already cut out of them. Um, uh, in order uh, for the giants to use them. So I do think they must be stone cutting, which is a big deal because this already puts the giants on a much more sophisticated level of technology than, for instance, the humans who did the Barrow Downs, right? And if we look at his armor and clothing, now his, you know armed loincloth here is could be repurposed. He doesn't have to have necessarily forged each one of those metal plates himself. Um, his club, his spiky club, is also... Oh, is that meant to evoke like a rose? Kind of looks... I'm trying to figure out what the head of his mace is meant to represent. It almost does look representative. Does it look like a this flower opening? It looks like a flower to me. Yeah. Or maybe I mean, I a beetle? I wouldn't have... Yeah, maybe a beetle, but it, I think it's interesting. I think it's... Uh, especially with the spikes coming out, you know, suggesting the rose thing. Um, I think that it's... Uh, well, I wouldn't have guessed that. A giant carrying a club that has a head like an opening rose. You know, like a rosebud. That's a uh, that's a giant who's really confident in his masculinity, for one thing. Um, but it's also... Yeah, so the metal plates, he needn't have forged those. Um, yeah, I agree. The... Um, um, uh, that they could um, have taken those from elsewhere, or that could even have been from, you know, pieces of a, of sort of smaller armor that's sort of put together. But he looks like he sewed his own waistcoat there. He's got no buttons, but, you know, his little vest there is obviously patches of what looks like hide all stitched together. And then his little hairy skirt. And his bracers are simple, 
it looks like hide just wrapped around his forearms. But we've got fairly intricate carving on his mace. But though nothing that looks quite as with the same level of detail as those metal plates. I think that, and that's why I'm thinking he might have gotten those from elsewhere. Um, anyway. That's a very interesting, it's a very interesting beginning glimpse of giant culture. Does anybody remember? I did it once, but I don't remember it anymore. What's the plot with this guy? This is a named giant and he's got a plot line to him. Somebody remind me of uh, Arafel's plot line here. Because he's a friendly giant, right? I mean, he's he's not attacking us. He seems to be a more or less decent giant, this guy. At least just based on the fact that he's not aggroing us right away. Anyway, let's go on and find the other homes of the giants. Well, somebody tells me about that. Yeah, I, I was pretty sure I remembered that too, Hologra, that he's basically friendly. Yeah, belongs mine, right? Yeah, we defend him from other giants who are attacking him, right? So he's like a separatist giant, right? Yeah, so why are the other giants after him? The other giants are after him because he's a nonconformist giant? He's an elf friend? Yeah, I seem to recall that he was uh, listed as an elf friend. Yeah. So, yeah, he was definitely not uh, well-loved by his own kind. Oh, hang on a second. This is the road to Eregion, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, of course. Every time I come through, I ride through here actually trying to go to Eregion, I can never find that particular cave opening or, you know, canyon. Uh, I always go down the wrong canyon and end up in the place with all of the crafting resources. Um, but now here trying to find the giant city, I instead go down the path. Okay. Need to go further down this Follow way. Follow the white horse, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember where it is. It's, like I said, it's just about the matter of going down the wrong canyon. So you have very similar clothing, except you're wearing little leggings. Whoa. Went right through your leggings there. Um, I was trying to figure the consistency of his leggings, but I think they're hide. They're not male, are they? Uh, I think it's a. Uh, yeah, they're patched. Within. Yeah, they've got stitching, right? Yeah. And yeah, he's got knee patches. Okay, so probably. Yeah, Frumius Bujum is thinking that the other giants are just bullying him for carrying a mace shaped like a giant flower. Um. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're just, you know, questioning his lifestyle choices or, you know, his manners of personal expression. Um, and, of course, the giants pick up boulders and throw them because, like, they're giants and that's what they do in The Hobbit. Now, here we have, this looks like, okay, so this could be one of two things, right? This could either be a partially constructed giantish building with giant cut stones, as we talked about before, or this could be the ruins of another building from which the giants are are uh, quarrying the stone that they're using in their buildings, right? That is the mystery I'm trying to figure out. Can I? I want to. I want to get up. Jump. I can't jump. Won't let me. Darn it. Want to buy detached camera still. Yes, I do want the detached camera. I'm trying to look down over the valley. Well, the trees are obstructing my view anyway. Never mind. Okay. Well, we'll just ride down into the valley then. Okay. So we're riding down into the valley. Those are the waterfalls over there. I'm looking down. I can't see anything because of the trees. Okay. Bridges. I'm seeing scraps of walls. What's the story with these scraps of walls? Is this a wall that used to be there and is there no longer? Or is this a wall which was only half-heartedly built and then abandoned? The irregularity of the wall does not strike me as a ruin. 
this looks more like a half-built wall. Hang on, I can't even see where I'm going. Help. Okay. Messing around with my camera angle so much, I can't even... Okay, right, here's a good angle on it. All right. So this strikes me as a half-built, or not even half, a partially-built wall, rather I than... Answer. Huh? You have an answer? I, f I found a hammer and a chisel. Did you find I a hammer did. and chisel? Okay. Cause it, so the reason I'm thinking this is not this is not a ruin is that this, because of the way the breaks are by, by layer here, right? Um, and it's not broken off like we usually see the, you know, the Arnorian ruins broken off. We're seeing the clean edges of the partially laid stone kind of like we're seeing attached to this other giant structure. See, this looks like a giantish house that was going to be a two-story house, right? They built the bottom story, and then they started building the top story up there, which we can't really see. I'm backing up until I'm probably going to fall off a cliff. There it is. I can just see it, right? So then they started to build the top story, and then they were like, yeah, nah, whatever. Let's just stop. All right. And let's instead stack some more of our giant blocks in other places. Yeah, see see the clean edges here? This is not something that collapsed. This is something that just didn't get finished. Where's your hammer and chisel? Um, come find a whole bunch of people. You found it. Oh, yeah, I found you. Where, where, where? Oh, right there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very bad chisel if it's made out of wood. That's not going right. to cut any kind it's of It's like stone. a wedge, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, so a hammer and a wedge. Okay. Clearly giantish tools, obviously. Right. Okay. Okay. So, and the wedge is very interesting, right? Because the wedge suggests this is not something that is... Because you could, you could argue, you know, the presence of tools doesn't absolutely prove that they're shaping the stone themselves... Um, it could mean that they're like using the tools to beat these old ruins apart and take the stone away. But again, like, look at this little gap. We almost never see this kind of step-like thing in an Arnorian ruin. It just doesn't look like a ruin. I mean, if there's one thing we know, it's ruins, right? We've seen lots and lots and lots of ruins, and none of them have looked like this. And not notice also that this stone block that you guys are standing on is not the same shape as the other stone blocks. Like if we look at these blocks here and we look at the blocks that this little partial wall is made of, right? These are smaller. These are smaller than these big blocks. So the hammer and wedge suggests they're going to, to try to cut off a chunk of of this larger rock in order to make one of these blocks that they can then continue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the giants are in fact cutting the stone here. Okay. Whoa. Oh, come on. Stupid windows. Okay. Um, I would also venture, I mean, personally, there's no decoration, no ornamentation. Yes. This is pure function. And pure function. Giants, yeah, and the giants are pretty much the only culture in game that does this. Uh, you mean not decorate things? Yeah. I mean, it's just rock. There, there's no designs, no art to it. Nothing to make it look pretty. And giants are pretty much the only ones to do it that way. Yeah. Who, who, you're only like this pot for instance, is completely functional, completely non-pretty, as you say. Um, what, um, what do we make of the flower mace, though? That is about the only artistic thing, cultural thing that I've ever seen with the giants uh, in-game that I can recall. Right. Now, we can imagine that they yeah these uh hanging you know leather curtains are like the only 
thing that we're seeing here. Um, you know, the only sort of decorative features that all, and they're not decorative, even though they're functional, clearly. Um, anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh, right, the mace. I'm tempted to think, of course, that somebody else made that mace, uh, and that, you know, he just found it. But or did who, the elves get it? The, el the, the elves make it for him. That that's yeah. a good thought. I mean, if he's an elf friend, they might have made him a gift. Because it's a giant sized mace. I mean, no one else would wield that. Dwarves could make it, but they wouldn't. It's bigger than they are, right? Um. And if the elves forged his mace for them, it would make like uh, elves making a giant mace would be like let's shape it like the like a rosebud, right? That would be all kinds of sense. So that it reflects not his own increased artistic sensibility, but the artistic sensibility and perhaps also the sense of humor of his elvish friends, right? Um, Laura, I'm looking at the uh, architecture of the bridge here. Very simple, just elongated blocks of stone laid across buttress and it probably looks like it's just held by gravity they just lie upon that central divide there's no appearance of mortar or anything like that and we don't get we, we don't get any statues or shrines are these and again remind me because I, I don't remember it's been so long since I've done these quests in here. Um, are the giants in here affiliated with anything? The, are they connected with Angmar? Are they connected with Sauron at all? Do they talk about? I don't. I haven't seen any commentary from them that suggests it. Oh, I just I don't saw. Uh, related quest. I just saw one of these standing stones, which I thought was like a standing stone, which would itself be decorative and interesting. But no, it's just another cook pot. Yeah. So shelters, and cook pots, and random walls. Amethorn says they're independent, and I'm inclined to agree. I don't recall there being any reference to them being anything but independent. And generally, Angmar is kind of big on making sure their minions or allies have some sort of, you know, the symbolism of you yes. know, the Angmar and, you know, logos and whatnot. You, you got to have the patches on the uniform. Exactly. Right. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're fairly brand conscious uh, in Angmar. I agree. Yeah, look how poorly laid the, the ceiling is. Right. Look how uneven are the rocks uneven in both directions. It would not keep the rain out. No. No, it would not. Yeah, so the stones are cut squarely, but they're not laid evenly. Even, as I say, even the functionality is sort of limited, um, like the bridges. Right. I mean, those look like the, the, the I mean, they're solid enough because they're very heavy stone. Um, but again, they're just kind of like balancing on there. And yeah, oh, hey, look at this. Mr. Giant Head Smasher's got a mace just like that, though. Uh Oh, not unique. He's not unique. Ah. Interesting. So he is just like that other guy. This isn't the boss, though, is it? The boss is near. Is the boss up? Is there further up? No, this is the furthest up layer. Is that guy the boss with the mace? No. Which one's? Isn't there a? Isn't there a leader? Am I remembering that correctly? Or 
Or is this guy like not the head smasher, but like the head smasher? I was pretty sure there was a giant chieftain or something. I wanted to find him. I thought the leader was up there too. I was expecting to find him there, but I didn't I don't see him unless he's the head smasher with the mace. Still leader according to Holy Girl. Hmm. No, I just remember winding my way up here on a quest, which was sending me specifically to these dudes up here. Yeah. So it's definitely intriguing that our head smasher here has the same maze that our elf friend does, so it kind of puts pay to our little theory about the elves making uh, our friend a gift, unless this guy stole the first gift, and then the elves had to make a second. <clears throat> or maybe he was dual-wielding, and I was only single-wielding. Right. I was just thinking of the replacement theory, too. I kind of like that. So, the other, the other guy goes sheepishly back to the elves, and is like, uh... They came and took my fancy flowery mace away. Could you make me another one? And they're like, okay. Yeah, I like that theory too, Amethorn. I'm going to go with that too. Because this guy, I think, is just too dumb to realize he's holding a mace that's shaped like a flower. Yeah, I think this, this is the boss guy. In as much as there is a boss guy. Okay. Hmm. What? What is this structure? It's like a filled-in house. It's like a house with no ceiling, no walls, and no floor. Or one wall, I guess. Could it be a tomb? That's what I was wondering with that door-like area. At first I thought maybe it might be some kind of, like, throne recess or something, but there's no... Maybe you stand maybe, here. Maybe they were copying the secret door, only they can't make doors that are invisible like the dwarves. Right. Yeah, who knows? Maybe... Yeah, see, Frumius, I was thinking the same thing. It's like being a department head, right? You know, there's a bunch of smashers, but this guy's the head smasher. Um, yeah. Is there a prefect head smasher? Is it what? A, a prefect pre smasher. Right, a prefect smasher, sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I love how from in here we can see all around the valley. So. So. The alternative valley, right? Full of um, evil giants and one more or less decent giant and dragons the things which don't come to Rivendell, right? So we have like the Rivendell and the anti-Rivendell here. Um, even the, you know, thinking Druid's Fire of the Contrast, um, implicit in what you were suggesting about the non-decorative elements, right, of, uh, of the giants here, how they don't make anything pretty, which of course, as we will see, is largely different uh, from what we find in Rivendell. You know, it's a very anti-elvish sort of point of view. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the most decorative thing on them is their clothes, and that's very, fairly plain. Right. Right. And mostly um, mostly I, and mostly accidental, I think, except for the mace. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. 
it's just an interesting move. Uh, an, an interesting move on the devs' part. Um, to have this sort of, yeah, bizarro Rivendell, this, uh, this sort of flip side of Rivendell. Really interesting. We'll think, maybe we'll think a little bit more about this as we get to Rivendell 2, and it'll come into closer relief. Anyway, it's getting super late. Uh, I should uh, let people go. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me this week. Uh, next week, we will be uh, coming closer to Rivendell. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to go because there's almost nowhere else to go but Rivendell now. And we're still not quite there in the book. Almost, but not quite. Uh, but I think we've now been officially everywhere in the Trollshaws except for Rivendell, haven't we? Well, the Ettenmoors, kind of, but you can't go there unless you want a PvP. Yeah. I mean, you, can there. Uh, you can use the Staple Master, but. Again, you don't want to go there unless you want to Yeah, I've never been there for that reason. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll think about that more later. Anyway, the point now is thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you guys uh, next week as we actually travel through uh, the, uh, uh, the Ford next week. So thanks, everybody. See you guys next week. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.